started. It's okay to start. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll be the only one that starts on the dot, so we'll do that. We're Americans here. <laughs> I'm dual, mm -hmm. so I can do that. Whichever way I hit, it flows. Okay, dokes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Good morning, Al. Hey, good morning, Ann. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mainly from CMU will be signing in in a few minutes, in a few seconds. In a few seconds. Okay, so your group is, uh, you brought in the whole gang from Bukidnon. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and people from uh, UPLB just said, hi, good morning to you. Also, UPLB. Magandang umaga, bayan. I can be an announcer, actually, if I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also Louis she's out. Okay, Louis, you can you can unmute and already and say hello to the group. But okay, I think we'll start, guys. Okay. So good morning. This is the 10.3 parallel session on R and D commercialization and technopreneurship. So uh, today we have a very good roster of speakers. Uh, both from the U.S. as well as from Australia and the Philippines, of course. And uh, out of the five companies, uh, there are two that are local. And uh, then there's three support groups, mainly Academe, represented by UP System, uh, Louis Sison, and uh, the OST Pichard. And last but not the least, uh, my group in uh, with Richard Abendan of USAID Stride uh, as part of the S&T ecosystem for technopreneurship and R&D commercialization in the Philippines. So I think uh, without uh, too much introduction, you just had uh, uh, been introduced to Carlito Lebrilla last uh, uh, last Tuesday, I think, or yesterday. Yes, Carlito is a professor at UC Davis. He's the $6 million man, I call him, because of his $6 million uh, MS equipment in his lab, which I've been to. <laughs> but he's done uh, uh, so much work on uh, uh, sugar uh, uh, structures uh, and for food and nutrition. I still remember his uh, uh, discovery on bifida, uh, the uh, mother's milk bacteria that helps our babies digest their mother's milk. And I think today he's going to talk about exactly the translation of research in his lab moving to commercialization uh, in his various efforts, including Bifida. So I think with that very short introduction, by the way, Carlito is the current board of directors chairman of PAASE, and he's been very helpful in getting us all organized and active. And uh, so uh, I always like the leader to uh, lead by example so uh, clearly he's doing that today so with that introduction i think i'll uh, uh, ask carlito to begin his presentation carlito carlito yeah, uh, can you share thank your... you al um yeah. it looks like it looks like the there's a little bit of a pause, so I hope um, I'm coming through clearly to you. Yes. I okay, can good. see your screen now, and uh, you're a little person on the corner. Okay, there we go. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, my experiences in starting companies. Um, you know, when, when I first started my, uh, my job at UC Davis, a um, long time ago now, uh, I, I never thought I would be starting company. I thought it would just be, I would be a scientist, an academic, and that's all, and, and new discoveries. And, uh, and I thought starting companies just wasn't in my, in my bag. Uh, but now, today, there's a lot of people doing um, starting companies, and it's, it's now a lot more easier to start them. And there's a lot less resistance towards it. So I'm going to give you my experience. Uh, these are the, the companies that I've been involved with, uh, most of them. There's a couple more, but uh, this sort of represents um, 
all that uh, that I'm going to talk about today. So, this Glycometrics is a company that um, was uh, uh, was developed was um, was set up to develop biomarkers for cancer. We founded this in 2005, and uh, I had to dissolve it in 2015. But it was a it was a brand new concept on looking at um, um, biomarkers from blood related to post translational modification, and this is a sort of my learning company, and I'll show you why that is. Uh, another company we started in 2013 is called Evolve Biosystems. This is the most successful so far. This has uh, uh, nearly a hundred million dollars in uh, VC funding. It has 50 employees, and uh, you can you can get the product commercially now. Uh, in 2018, we founded a company that was similar to Glycometrics called Interven, but with much better technology. So it was essentially a restart with a better CEO, uh, and a uh, so we just completed we completed a, a Series A round of 15 million, and just. Last month, we closed the Series B. Uh, I, I can't tell you yet how much that is. Um, we're gonna have a, a press release for that shortly. And then uh, last year, we started another company called BCD Biosystems. It is a, a bioactive carbohydrate company for adult nutrition. So it sort of matches the Evolve Biosystems. Uh, we've completed a seed round, just a small seed round to show the concept, but the people that we have uh, investing in us are, are pretty well known in, in, in the space. So this is um, a, a paper that was published uh, in 2011, where we, we looked at the, um, the serum of, of, uh, of women with breast cancer and found that certain uh, glycoproteins, so post-translational modifications of protein, were elevated in those with breast cancer. And then what we did was we took the, 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 the cancer and we put it in mice and we found that the same thing happened that when you let the tumor grow, the mice uh, would uh, upregulate these uh, compounds and then when you cut the tumor out, it would, it would go away. And so uh, with several of those results, we, we, we filed a patent in 2006. Uh, well, actually, this was 2011. We had earlier results, but this is sort of a culmination of that. So we filed the patent earlier in 2006, and it was actually granted four years later in 2010. And uh, it, it, uh, the patent is this, is up here. Uh, it was um, actually mentioned in NPR, uh, even in the news. This is a video of the news that talks about this discovery. Uh, so it was actually quite, uh, we got a lot of good publicity from that. And so here's the sequence of events that, that happened. Um, we filed the provisional patent in 2005. In 2006, we filed the full patent. We incorporated a company in Delaware. We won several awards. We won the People's Choice Award in UC Davis and also in the Big Bang in UC Berkeley. We got a seed and fund of 120,000 from the friends and family. That's how you often start. You call it a friends and family round. And that's enough to just get you some um, essentially, it's not enough to do anything, but it's just enough to establish a company. Uh, we formed an executive board. We had a CEO who was a recent MBA student. Uh, we partnered with a Korean company who gave us $150,000 in infusion just uh, to collaborate with us. And we presented to venture funds in Silicon Valley, and we ha I had to dissolve the company in 2015. And this is a a picture that people show all the time. This is, uh, uh, it's called the Valley of Death. This is where research, this is where we were, and this is where grants were funding uh, our research. And this is when VCs or venture capitalists start funding you. And so this, this is where, it's called the Valley of Death because this is where most ideas of companies die. And the point where research funding ends and uh, sort of, uh, I'm sorry, those are my dogs in the background. And this is where uh, uh, sort of corporate money starts. And so that's where we, we, we failed. Uh, in the US, you can get NIH funding called SBIR grants that allows you to bridge that. Uh, another research that we did was on human milk. That too uh, sort of took off. And 
it became very uh, popular, very well known. Uh, it was it was uh, featured in Nature. It made the cover of Chemical and Engineering News. It even made the New York Times. It became the most uh, the most read or the most emailed article in the New York Times. And the idea here was that there were certain components of milk that fed a certain bacteria. Uh, and these are my two co-founders. There were uh, two others. Uh, and what we found, though, was that this bacteria was decre was sort of going away in, in the United States and also in developed countries. Uh, and this bacteria uh, it, it does a lot of things, but one of the things that it does is it um, sort of makes the colon, it acidifies the colon so that it eliminates pathogenic bacteria and also antibiotic resistance bacteria. And so, uh, so uh, it was, this was an opportunity because the, the bacteria was disappearing. So what we did, wanted to do was commercialize the bacteria, right? Uh, and so the question then, when you come across something like this, is do you patent or not? Uh, so companies uh, have two types of intellectual properties. They have patents and they have trade secrets, right? And so, uh, so, so patenting is, is, is pretty important. But as a young scientist, I was sort of against patents. I thought I wanted to, um, you know, I thought you wanted unhindered free flow of knowledge. I later I, I realized later on that if you have a patent, a VCs will uh, will invest in your company, and if you don't have that patent, they may not. And so, if you have a patent, there's a bigger chance of commercializing your invention than without a patent. So you definitely want the patent. So patents are the strongest forms of IP. Uh, they provide, unfortunately, a recipe that others may follow. And so if you don't want them to follow something, then you would put it in a trade secret. You don't have to tell anyone about it. However, if you want to get money, the first thing that venture capitalists will ask is, is there a patent? Now, on the other hand, I have started companies without patents, but it's always easier with a patent, right? A patent allows you to use it for 15 years. If you file a provisional patent, which is a intention to file a patent, then you get an additional year, right? So uh, uh, patents are pretty similar worldwide. Um, uh, I'll explain the US one because that's the one I'm most familiar with. And there are three types of patents. Uh, there's the utility patents, there's the design patents, and the plant patents. And the utility of patents include both the composition of matter, which is a stronger one, or a way of doing things. For example, uh, the way to manufacture and so on. However, regardless of your patent, you have to, they have to be useful and they have to be novel and non-obvious. And that, that means then if someone, or if you publish a paper already on your invention, uh, then it's no longer novel or non-obvious, right? Uh, and so, so then we filed our patent, uh, but a few years later, this happened. This is the famous Myriad case. And what this did was it says, if you can't, if a product is naturally occurring, you can't patent it, okay? Because what happened was a lot of people were patenting genes uh, and RNAs. And so what the, the patent examiner or the patent uh, judgment decided was that um, that was just stifling ideas too much. And so now if it's naturally occurring, you can't patent it. But there are ways around that. And so what we did then, is we couldn't patent the bacteria because that was naturally occurring. You can't patent the human milk oligosaccharides that was feeding the bacteria. However, the combination of the two is a patent, and that's what we did. And what we found was that there were enzymes to support that. We found enzymes in the bacteria that was actually breaking down these oligosaccharides. And so we filed three patents, uh, we, actually much more than that. But anyway, these were the three basic ones. One was on the, on the genome sequence of the bifido and how they were using, they were being used. The other was on the human milk oligosaccharides and how they promote the bacteria. And then we found later on that cow's milk does similar things. And so these were the, the basis for that company evolved. And so from our, ve from our very basic invention of the, figuring out what were the structures of these human milk oligosaccharides to the fact, to figuring out what they did and all the way to product, and now you can see, you can buy this thing in, in UC, in uh, hospitals in the US. Uh, so Kaiser Permanente is using them. The Gates, the Bill and Melinda Gates Fund is, uh, is doing a lot of clinical trials with them. And then uh, 
different uh, states like Oregon Health System is also using these things. So this happened this last October. What happened was that um, a company was infringing our patent. So this is, a, a, you may know this company, it's Abbott, and they, they made, they, they're the maker of Similac. And so they were creating a similar product to us. And so uh, uh, our, the company itself uh, is suing that, them, but because the patent belongs to the UC, the UC themselves is, is suing Abbott. And so this is sort of an interesting situation because as a company, if we were small, we could never go against Abbott. But the fact that the, the, the patent was a University of California patent, which is a huge, huge enterprise within its own right, now it's an even fight between the University of California and, and uh, Abbott. And that, that uh, is actually in the courts at the moment. So here's what happened. Um, we found an evolved biosystem. Uh, this is, so we filed multiple patents. Uh, we incorporated in Delaware, the founders round. We did a 2013, we formed an executive board. And this is where the big difference was between the previous company and this company. We hired a, um, a seasoned veteran of uh, starting companies. This guy, uh, David Kyle, was the past CEO of a company called Martech. And he was the CEO when they sold that company to DSM for $1.2 billion. Uh, so this guy, and, and this is the, from what I find now, this is the key. You got to have experienced talent. In any case, we had a seed round of a million dollars. We presented, we went around Silicon Valley presenting this. We did a series A round of 9 million with very well-known VC funds, did a bunch of more clinical trials. Uh, we did a series B of 20 million, series D of 40 million. And, and right now they're in the process of doing a series D. These were some of our backers. And we're now in the process of uh, really just hopefully that the company is not taking and everywhere. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk about how the other companies I started, but it follows a very similar path. Um, but what, what did I learn from the companies? Well, one is that good science is not enough. Patents do not need the, the other thing that I learned is that when, when you write a patent, it's not like writing a paper at all. You need a lot, uh, it's much more harder to write a paper than to create a patent, okay? So don't let that get in your way. Um, you have to choose the right people to work with you. Uh, startup are like marriages and it's, a, it's like, it's a difficult divorce if people have, if people have to let, be let go. Um, I want, be selective about the advice you take when you're first starting out. Everyone has an advice for you and a lot of it is just wrong. So, but the best advice I can give you is to get an experienced CEO. Uh, negotiate and the technology transfer well and this is, even from UC Davis, they actually were not at the time very good at uh, technology transfer. There's very few universities in the world that do this very well. And uh, at the time UC Davis was not one of them, but we actually helped um, them learn. Uh, also as a founder, you have to let go of the technology. It, it may be something that you really love and something you really wanna be involved in, but you know, as an academic, you don't know, uh, I don't know business very well. And so it's, be it's, it's best to let it go and let the, uh, the experts take over. And, and this is a, a, an opportunity for everyone. I think food and gut health is really a, rest, uh, a rising area. Uh, and so with that, I think that's all I have, but uh, just, um, just to let you know what it's like to, to start a company, what, what you need to know, and, uh, and I hope this helps you in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlito. That was a very nice, short and sweet. I uh, hope you become a unicorn this year. Uh, I don't know with the COVID, maybe we'll have to do a wait a little bit. But I think uh, it's on its way to become a a, vindle, uh, a valuation of over a billion. It's a unicorn for those people out there that are not used to venture capital language. But uh, hopefully, we will have our first passive member founder unicorn. <laughs> not too long from now and hopefully there'll be more so uh, they always say uh, lead with your best uh, bet so I led with Carlito unfortunately we won't have any chance to do a Q&A right away uh, you can still post your questions on the chat and Carlito can try to respond to it 
but we will move on to our next speaker uh, in, uh, uh, and then we'll reserve the Q&A later after all the five companies have spoken and uh, uh, be able to have presented their different experiences. So I think next on deck. Thank you very much, Vic. That was uh, another, <laughs> another world-class presentation, I must say. Uh, Thank you. And uh, clearly, uh, to me, uh, these are two of the best minds we have in technology commercialization going into real uh, venture finance and worldwide application of their research and technology. Congratulations both Carlito and Vic, if I must uh, say so. Uh, uh, what we'll do now is uh, we'll uh, again delay the Q&A for later, but I hope it piqued your interest. To me, I learned again that there was a botanical park pathway. I didn't realize that. I have not recommended that to any of our Tuklas Lunas in the audience, but now you know. So maybe we can pursue that scientist of uh, the Tuklas Lunas uh, research, uh, including Anne Villalobos, who of course is uh, very much helping uh, Bukidnon at CMU. So we'll talk about that on the side. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we'll have to move on to our next speaker. Uh, this is uh, another foreign speaker. Uh, this is the uh, luxury of having Zoom now. We can get speakers from all over the world. So, uh, Homer Pantua is based in San Francisco in Genentech. But the unique thing with Homer is he is a co-founder of a company here in Batangas. And he will be talking about that uh, today as part of his R&D commercialization and technopreneurship. So I think without much uh, more uh, description about uh, his background, uh, I'll let him, uh, he's going to be in another session later on anyway. So you can check out his CV elsewhere, but I'll let him have the floor now. Thank you, Homer. Ming salamat din sa'yo, Homer. <laughs> That's a good Thank presentation. You. Thank you. Thank you quick. for a very uh, well-assembled uh, jigsaw puzzle there. Uh, clearly, uh, you got your uh, targets and goals uh, all arranged up. And, uh, yeah. So we have heard three excellent speakers so far talking about how to digest baby's milk and how to start a company behind that to become a hundred million dollar venture. You have spirulina stress extracts that is addressing a worldwide market starting from your nails and your toes. Now we have Homer who's presenting your applications towards the veterinary animal and uh, clearly a big issue now on African swine flu. And I'm still live. Cut. Yeah. I know I see Sir Al. No. I think we kind of lost uh, Al. Um, all right. So <laughs> he spoke with me earlier anyway. So I think that in his absence, uh, we should proceed. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to. Look at the program here. Uh, okay, does anybody have the program? Yeah, I think I'm next. All right, so uh, I understand you're Isagani, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, all right. <laughs> so our next speaker is Isagani Padolina. I know you're with a company, and tell me again your company, please. It's Pascual, Pascual Pharma Corporation. Pascual Pharma Corporation, yes. So without further ado, please, uh, Isagani, uh, the yes. floor is yours. Thank yes. you. Yes. I'm going to start sharing. Can you guys see the slide? Uh, yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Start. 
the slideshow. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah? Yes, you're all set. Yes. You can proceed. Good morning, good morning, good evening to uh, good morning to the people here in the Philippines and um, uh, good evening to um, our uh, participants also from the US. I just like to thank Paase briefly for uh, this uh, opportunity to um, fellowship with you guys today and also for the brain horsepower that uh, Paase has. Um, we've, we've, uh, we've taken advantage of that a lot of times um, at Pascual Pharma, uh, just getting ideas and also uh, helping solve the problems that we have. So today I'm gonna focus more on uh, the past, the past three speakers uh, talked about um, uh, commercialization of uh, uh, products from the lab um, to market. Um, what I'm going to focus more on is um, kind of the, 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 the choices that we have to make after commercialization. So I'm going to talk more about the research and development, the continuing research and development that we've had to do um, after commercializing um, uh, uh, research that that's based um, from the academe, right? So, so what I'm going to focus on today is uh, so I'm in the lab right now. Um, we're operating at 25% at the UPLB Science and Technology Park. Um, the the RAs are sleeping here, so there's kind of I just want to make sure that you don't see the beds that are on the floor. Everybody's just trying to wake up, um, and so. So we're just, I, what I want to focus on is a project, you know, so I'll talk about the, the R&D commercial, the post commercialization efforts that we're doing. And I'll talk about in context of a, a project that's, that's funded by DOSD. Okay. So last year, I had the opportunity to talk, talk at uh, the Paase meetings, the annual meetings in Manila. Um, and we talked about the critical elements of industry academic partnerships, you know, talking about three factors, leadership, talent, and institutional processes, right? So, so we talked about for leadership, you know, fostering a culture of competence and quality decision making. For talent, we talked about design, design and competence and also data integrity. And for the institutional processes, we talked about um, design as well, you know, like uh, designing experiments and also and also the uh, the processes involved in making sure tools are available for scientists to use. Right. So today I'm going to focus more on, you know, what are the challenges that we're facing, you know, especially if we have limited R and D talent and capacity. So we don't. We focus more on sharing instead of institutionalizing talent. You know what I mean? Like instead of hiring talent from the already limited um, uh, uh, resources that we have in the academe, we push our network out and, and take advantage of those brain horsepower while they're existing at the academe, right? The current challenge here in the Philippines is it's a generics driven business. We have a lot of established, it's an established products market, you know, so R&D is not really a priority when it comes to, to, to uh, pushing uh, sales here and marketing in the Philippines. You know, we focus more on sales and marketing efforts, right? So, so that's a, a big challenge too, um, in terms of the research culture in the industry, right? And the other challenge is speed to market through licensing and pre-registered pre drug products. So I'm also going to talk about the choices that we've had to make when we're choosing between products, you know, from, from, from technology transfer from the academe and also products that are also existing, you know, in other countries um, from other suppliers. Okay. So the project that I wanted to focus on today is our efforts to, to uh, improve and standardize one of our crown jewels, which is Relief Sambong. So Relief Sambong, Sambong is a, is a registered um, home remedy product. So basically, like what Vic was talking about, we have a, uh, uh, what we call a home remedy pathway here in the FDA for uh, extracts and uh, uh, natural product extracts. And so that, that's where Sambong is, uh, 
is is registered into right so, sambong is a is a product you know just i'm just going to introduce it briefly sambong is a product that was uh, developed by up and dosd and was commercialized by pascual pharma in the late 1990s and it has grown into uh, uh, one of our biggest products. Um, it's for anti-urolithiasis. It's a diuretic drug. It's uh, for dissolution of kidney stones. Um, it's 96% it's of the market, including, including the synthetic drugs. You know, so it's a very effective uh, uh, product. It's, it's, its demand is driven through prescription from the doctors, even though it's an OTC product. So the, the, the effort is really, when we standardize, we have two options. We either standardize it through a known compound or we standardize it to a clinically significant compound. So that's what we're trying to do is instead of picking just a, a marker, we want to pick a marker that's clinically significant, right? So part of the, there's three efforts going into that. One is developing the right bioassay, right, to, to make sure that we have the proper markers, you know, uh, we're, we're studying the proper markers. We also wanted to study the agronomy of the plant itself. So, so we wanted to see how the, so if you think about the plant, it's like a big organic chemistry lab, you know, it produces a bunch of these uh, compounds that are beneficial, right? Um, and the environment has a, there's a lot of environmental factors that play a role into how that profile is produced. So by collaborating with TIP, the Technological Institute of the Philippines, we're trying to look at those abiotic stressors um, to see how we can control, you know, for lack of a better term, the uh, profile that we want to extract, right? We're also looking at the post-harvest, um, the effect of post-harvest parameters, for example, the, uh, the ratio of polar and non-polar um, extraction parameters um, to see how we can further standardize that clinically significant profile, right? So what I'm gonna go through in the next couple of slides is just show you um, a proof of concept um, of this ongoing project um, that's funded by DOSD. It's a cradle grant funded by DOSD. So this shows you a profile of Sambong. You know, we have a project with Carlito Lebrilla, a separate project on a, on a, on, on a glycomics of, uh, of uh, lung cancer and using natural product extracts to, to see how those glycomic profiles are, are uh, influenced, right? And so a part, of the, a part of that is the help, the brain horsepower that we get from Carlito and his lab in also developing a method that allows us to look at the uh, different uh, compounds in some bone. Right, so this is a result of that. Just to, just to highlight some of the things that we've we've uh, some of the collaborative efforts that we've uh, we've experienced with Paase, with Paase members. So so from this profile, so we know what's there. We know the different. We have the standards. We have the isolated compounds. So the question is, is this clinically significant? Right. So that's the next question, and part of that is developing the the bioassay. And part of it is also controlling how that profile comes into play, right? So in our collaboration with TIP, with its engineers and data analysts, uh, data scientists, you know, so we're, this just kind of illustrates the neural network that we're trying to establish. Um, and it looks at the different metabolites. It, look at, it looks at, it interfaces with the results from the bioassays that we're looking at. And it also looks at the different environmental factors over here, such as soil pH, light intensity, temperature, soil chemistry, et cetera. And also looking at solvent polarity and drying temperature and extraction time. So hopefully when we get all that data, we can kind of predict, you know, the holy grail is, um, can we modify or predict, you know, the profile that we're getting, you know, from the plants, right? considering that it's very plastic. It's very plastic when the profile is produced. All right, so we've developed, this is our first prototype. So we got, we, from that grant, we got a greenhouse in UP Los Baños 
um, in our lab at the UPLB Science and Technology Park. And you can kind of see the Sambong plants there and, and some of the wires coming in into the sensors and the light sensors. Right? This is uh, the global environmental sensor and the local environmental sensor for the spots. The global sensor is for the bigger, bigger uh, uh, abiotic stressors like light, temperature, and, and relative humidity. Right, so, so after putting these sensors in, this is hooked up to, the, uh, to a server, and we started collecting data. I kind of want to show you where we're at, right? Kind of exciting. Right? So, so one of the issues we're having is, is internet connectivity and power outages. So UPLB still suffers from, from power outages. You know, we're not, we're, 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 we're still on the uh, old grid, you know, that we're trying to manage. And, and you can see here in this graph, just from the moisture sensor, that we've, we're, we're getting a lot of missing data. Um, um, in some aspects, there's more missing data than the others when you look at the different pots of, of plants, right? So what, what our data scientists from TIP did is look at this data. If you look at letter A, um, you can see kind of the missing data in May 10, after May 17, between May 17 and May 24, and between May 24 and May 31. So what they did is they, they used an algorithm to kind of impute um, and, and, and put in new data, right? To, to sort of uh, help us normalize uh, the things that we're seeing. And the, the algorithm that they use replicates the variability that we see in the data that we have collected. So kind of just a surrogate data, just so we can analyze, analyze the, uh, the, the, the whole, the, the, the multiple points, you know, um, um, and overcoming the missing data challenge. So the next part is um, trying to normalize that data, right? Because you can see here in the x-axis for A, we've got times 10 to the fourth, right? So we wanted to normalize it just between zero and one. So what these, the data scientists, the TIB kind of look, it's kind of interesting is they used a uh, stock market um, data transformation um, algorithm, you know, called the Williams R. You know, it's, it's one of the algorithms in the stock market that they, they used to predict, you know, when you would buy and sell. And um, they use that to normalize this data. And you will see from the bottom, you know, in C and D, these are the, these are the images that the neural network sees when they look at the data, right? If you can see from A to C, you know, the, the, the contrast is, is not that good. So we couldn't look at the differences between the data points that we've collected. You know, the transformation to William, using Williams R uh, kind of help us get more contrast, as you can see in the images on letter D. You know, the contrast has improved. It allows the neural network to study and analyze the data better and learn from it, right? So that's what we're trying to do. I kind of want to show you the result of that. You know, if we look at just a one-way street, so we're just we're not trying to to change uh, parameters yet, but we want to look at if it can predict um, chromatograms based on the data that it gets. So this is kind of this is the the the, the initial proof of concept that I want to show you guys, um, and it it uh, the the true chromatogram is at the top, and the prediction chromatogram is at the bottom. You can see that there, it's pretty good. It's pretty good in terms of profile, but we still have a lot of challenges when it comes to quantitation of those peaks, right? So that's the challenge that we're looking at. And, and um, the TIP team was just here a couple of weeks ago, so we can change the sensors, upgrade the sensors, and upgrade the uh, algorithms. You know, I'm gonna show you in the next slide, you know, some of the upgrades that we got. So you can see at the bottom left, um, the, old, um, the old setup that we have, we've got the new setup right here uh, with upgraded sensors, upgraded local sensors, upgraded global sensors, kind of see the uh, Coca-Cola um, modification that we've done to water, waterproof our power strips, right? 
Um, so hopefully with this better collection um, and better connection and a, a better generator uh, that, that we just, we just uh, was able, we were able to borrow from UPLB, we'll have a better, better data profile um, for, for, for predicting the chromatograms. So that's where we're at. I, um, part of the thing is, part, part of the big, big uh, effort right now is making sure we, we prepare for the next generation sambong, you know, which is, which is um, you know, not just more efficacious, but, but the quality, we're trying to focus more on the quality to make sure that, that uh, from, from, uh, from farming to manufacturing, uh, we're getting our quality systems in place, right? So the, where we're at from an industry academe perspective, you can see here from the World Economic Forum rankings, we, the Philippines has improved, you know, from rank 61 to in the 20s um, because of the uh, efforts made by USAID Stride, by Paase, um, and also by the Balik scientists that are coming from from, uh, from the U.S. and other countries like Anne Villalobos um, and also efforts by Homer, who's trying to establish um, collaborations with, with, uh, with, with academe here and academe abroad and also his own company here in, uh, in uh, the Philippines, right? So we're kind of, that's kind of good. It's, it's, it's looking better. You know, we're experiencing a lot of that too at Pascual Pharma, right? Our, our, our dream is kind of, we want to have a, a better collaboration, not just between industry and academe, but within our industry itself. And that's kind of hard because we don't focus on R&D. We focus on sales and marketing. But we're, we've been working with Joey at Unilab to establish more informal alliances. And hopefully we can replicate what they've done here at Pistoia, alliance.org. It's an alliance a pre-competitive and pre-commercialization alliance between different pharma companies uh, in the U.S. and in Europe, right? Right. So just to show you um, the challenge here in the Philippines, just to show you the market, so you can see what I was talking about in terms of generics, right? So, so in in 2018, the the Philippine pharma market is about 220 billion pesos. And it's largely driven by generics. You can see ethical, which is prescription drugs and OTC. It's mostly prescription. You can see in the MNC at the right side, you know, the MNC and local mix, you know, that's uh, about 50-50. A lot of that is, is uh, dominated by Unilab. So a lot of the growth is really generics based. We are a generics based uh, uh, market. We're not, uh, we don't produce APIs here. Our active pharmaceutical ingredients, and that's kind of where we want to go. And I hope the the push for vaccine production because of COVID nineteen kind of pushes our capacity that way. Um, um, so we're hoping for a for a, a a a better a better push in R and D in terms of in terms of producing our own API here. And we've got a good we've got a good. Uh, 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 um, atmosphere or, or, or environment in terms of um, biodiversity, right? And that's our, our, our opportunity to produce our own AP, natural product-based APIs. Right? So this is, I'm on my second to my last slide, right? Um, in choosing products in a generics-driven market, when we're trying to choose between academe-based technology and uh, and uh, Hold on, kinda, how do I get back? Hold on, sorry, sorry about that. Okay, so we were talking about academe-based technology and industry product sourcing. That's from a business development side. That's kind of what we're trying to balance, right? Because if we're a, in a generics business, it's very easy to look at established products coming from established sources, right? Because in terms of quality and reliability, the GMP standards are there. In terms of cost, it's low cost. 
and we mostly talk about transfer pricing arrangements. Speed is pretty fast, it's six months, you know, unless they don't have stability data for our zone, right? For our tropical zone. And the projected five year revenue is kind of known. We look at, these are our filters. We got to make 40 million pesos on the fifth year. If it doesn't do that, then we won't, we won't go into it. We won't spend resources into it. And when you look at academe based technology, when it comes to quality and reliability, the validation is limited, right? Cost is pretty high. And this is the current cost that we're looking at from UP tech transfer, right? Which is um, 1 million pesos for licensing and 5% on gross sales, which is pretty big, right? You're not gonna make, you know, aside from, aside from if you wanna make money, you're gonna definitely squeeze the farmers if you're doing botanical drugs and you're limiting um, access to the patients because you have to jack the prices up. Speed is still a challenge and the projected five-year revenue is unknown. So this is kind of the conversation that we're having also at, with the drug discovery program of DOST to try to um, get some of these uh, uh, considerations in play, especially when it comes to quality and reliability, cost and speed. Right. So hopefully I was able to talk about, you know, um, uh, the challenges that we're having, the choices that we have to make. Um, um, we're pretty good at pre-commercial uh, partnerships when it comes to industry and academia. Now. I'm really optimistic. I'm excited um, with the uh, 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 R&D ecosystem that a lot of people in this, in this community have created. You know, we're looking forward to more pre-competitive partnerships with our um, industrial partners, right, in pharma especially. Um, definitely continue capacity building efforts. We've got a huge, uh, uh, exciting opportunity with our biodiversity and our, uh, 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 our first Philippines-based API manufacturing hopefully will come from that. Um, balance also regulation with patient access, like I said, you know, with, in the previous slide, and it's kind of where, especially if we're trying to grow our locally sourced products. So these are our partnerships. Um, we're looking for more partners. You know, I wanna thank uh, PCHRD, USAID Stride, and Picari, um, Carlitos Lab at UC Davis, um, the different collaborators that we have at, from the University of the Philippines, Beth Lajos and Rev Juanico from TIP, our, our Ateneo de Manila partners who are trying to help us with the herbal supply chain our industrial partner, UrbanX, and Lung Center of the Philippines for, for helping us develop the bioassays. Thanks for listening. Um, and we go back to you, Al. Al, are you back? Yeah, I'm back. Thank you very much, Gani. Again, uh, actually, Gani is one of those people who doesn't need an introduction because of his family name. <laughs> but, <laughs> thank you very much for outlining exactly how a big pharma company like Pascual, local company, uh, uh, started collaborations way back and again I'm so proud to see your collaborations increasing from our original Ateneo days on uh, growing and looking at moisture content of the harvest of the farmers yes, yes. to now almost uh, doing actual science and chemistry and analytical capability with Carlito but it does take time clearly to me I've been back here for seven years after having been an entrepreneur for 17 and I'm patient but Sometimes it's really slow. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I hope that uh, you guys out there in the audience see what it takes for a company to license your technology. I mean, uh, Gani has had put, put out a nice outline in terms of revenue streams, development times, and licensing fees, which we will tackle in the next round of speakers. But for now, we will end our company presentations with the last but not the least probably the youngest of the companies i've asked to speak today is actually uh, based in de la Salle laguna uh, jerome is a actually a mentee of another paase member gobet advincula on the nanomaterial 3d printing side so i'm hoping that he can give us another perspective in terms of technology and development from coming from r d and going into commercial 
applications. He started his company after being in the semiconductor industry for quite some time. So he knows business. And even then, it does take time, as Jerome will probably outline. Jerome, I know you're in the audience. Please unmute and share your presentation. And I think uh, uh, Nanomatrix is uh, already well represented, so I won't introduce him beyond that. But please take it away, Jerome. Uh, good morning. Uh, can, you see, uh, can you see my slides? Yep, we see it okay. and we hear you. All right. So good, good morning to everyone. Good evening to the people in the audience coming from the U.S. And I think it's already like uh, afternoon in, uh, in Australia. So uh, I am uh, Jerome Palagans, by the way, and I'm actually the co-founder of Nanotronics. So Nanotronics, it's a local startup tech company. And I'll be, you know, uh, giving you our journey, our experiences, and also our challenges and lessons learned. So I'll be talking about commercialization of nanotechnology materials in the Philippine market. So it's glad that we see, you know, uh, technology emerging and actually being spread and commercialized in the U.S. and also in the forefront in Australia. But uh, in the local contents, how will it look like? So I'll give you what, you know, uh, it looked like and then how it is uh, how it is done here in the Philippines. Now, <clears throat> just a brief introduction. Uh, when you try to look at like the OECD report, uh, it says there that nanotechnology and 3D printing will be the major enablers of production evolution, which actually is having an impact now to manufacturing and actually in services. So having said that, uh, we have our company, so our company, it's Nanotronics Incorporated. So this is actually a tech startup company, as I've said earlier. And we are pioneering in the production of nanostructured materials coming from highly renewable indigenous plants. And also we provide a bespoke or customized technical solution, leveraging in our competency in nanotechnology material, advanced polymer, additive manufacturing, or actually 3D printing, as you call it, technologies. Now, uh, just to give you an idea what our, our product, so our, our first product that we introduced in 2018 is actually MTEX. It's a cellulose nanocrystal. And also, on the same year, we introduced MTEX TP due to the market demand coming from a client. So what it does, it does a lot of things, but basically, you use it for lightweight application. And then of course, since it's a bio-based, it's environmentally friendly. I can use it or we can use it for anti-corrosion coating our purposes. Since it's bio-based, it's biocompatible and biodegradable. Therefore, it is good in terms of like uh, for packaging and also for medical application. So from our experience, when we apply this material to say uh, any polymer, we get uh, toughness, so improvement in strength and also in uh, ductility by around 300 to 600%. So that depends on the type of polymer that you are using. Now, uh, just to give you, you know, a, a hindsight on our competitive advantage with our products. So our aspect ratio really gives us, you know, the biggest advantage. And secondly, when you look at our raw material, so we're using indigenous plants. So Currently in the Philippines, we can source it, or actually we can derive it coming from three indigenous plants here. We, uh, the Philippines is very rich in terms of natural resources. Uh, our competitor, or the one, that, the one existing in the market right now are coming from trees. The problem with that is that when you look at renewability, it's moderate because when you try to cut down tree, it will actually take like five to 10 years before you can actually have, you know, a regrowth and of, of course harvest it. Scalability wise, or we're highly scalable, it's compatible to all media. So be it on a powder, on a pellet, and also we try to look at say uh, on a liquid format because these are the type of like formats for the resin. Uh, one thing that differentiates us from the rest is that we do end uh, application customization. So based on the requirement of the customer, we actually can customize to that. And then we actually derive also our own product. So uh, just to share, we actually derive a resin for 3D printing. So for this is for biocompatible uh, 3D printing for stereolithography, which can be used uh, for, say, uh, prosthetic use. So that's uh, one of the many applications, by the way, of our material. Now, 
uh, the, the other product that we are producing, uh, so to speak, is if you're familiar with, so this is a, a graphene oxide. So we are producing a pristine graphene oxide. When you say pristine, uh, we are producing a monolayer because not every company in the world can produce, by the way, pristine graphene oxide. So we're just one of the handful. It has many advantages, by the way, when you try to use it. It is one of the polymers uh, we're in. Uh, you can have electrical and uh, uh, thermal uh, conductivity. So because of this, it has many applications. You can add it actually also so that you can have like fire retardancy uh, for your same material. It's also biocompatible and biodegradable. So with the pandemic right now, it has an antibacterial, anti-virus uh, uh, or virusoda uh, properties wherein I can use this for coating application. And uh, just to top it all, it has an application to almost uh, any industry. Now, these are the current markets that we are serving. So coming from electronics, uh, aerospace, 3D printing, water filtration, so marine composite, even in coating. Automotive right now, it's very strong going towards a sustainable packaging. So being driven by the European automakers, medical, and then packaging. So I just came you know, uh, from uh, a discussion actually from a reverse pitch uh, of, from one of the Silicon Valley uh, companies uh, last night. So there's a big push really on sustainable packaging and biocontent of the material as of today. So this will be uh, companies coming from both US, Japan, and actually uh, some from Europe. Now, in terms of our journey, uh, we started our journey in 2015. So just so you know, we are part of the DOST Pichert Human Resource Development Program. So we're the first batch uh, actually sent by Pichert uh, to uh, say study and actually to focus our research on advanced uh, polymers and also on 3D printing. So in this stage, we are looking at say a concept or in a look at certain uh, resources or materials here in the Philippines wherein we can apply our uh, say idea and then make it as a product. So that's a byproduct of that. So two years later, fresh from the US, we started, we actually gave a proposal to be shared way back then. And we were fortunate enough to be selected as one of the 15 startup grantees. So this is like Nanotronics and these are the rest of the startup companies, by the way, who were granted and also successful today. And in 2018, uh, we put up our pilot production. And of course we started production uh, from there on, actually, we've been uh, active in, in terms of marketing our nanomaterial products here and abroad. So just to give you a hindsight, so this is like Semicon Taiwan. Uh, you, will, you may be wondering why are we in Semicon Taiwan? Our product, by the way, the reason why uh, the Department of Trade and Industry Board of Investment invited us is because since we're using indigenous material to produce a nanomaterial, so it's a highlight we're in this is something that we can offer from the Philippines to the world. So Semicon Taiwan, it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, say conference for like Semicon or in electronics uh, uh, industries. Uh, so many uh, companies from all over the world are coming over there just to see what's the latest. And we were surprised that not so many are actually into the nanomaterial technology. And uh, just to give you also, an idea, uh, we are also part of the DTI, DOI, Supplier Development Program. So from here, this is composed of like uh, key enabling industries, mainly automotive, aerospace, and electronics. So th the, the people here are representatives coming from those say, companies. So uh, we have like President of Toyota and Mitsubishi, and the rest will be the presidents of the different associations. And of course, there are people from the World Bank who are actually promoting and supporting this uh, collaboration. So what it does is that it links uh, companies like us, so the small, medium enterprise, to the multinational so that there would be like a collaboration. And then of course, it is an opportunity for us to showcase and help those companies with our technology, as well as these companies with later on our supplier, uh, sorry, our customer and also our partner who will grow us to the next level. Now, on our milestone, I'll not go through this since we started in 2018, but just to summarize, uh, we have already set up our pilot production uh, plant, just as what Al has mentioned. So we actually have our uh, pilot plant inside the LaSalle Science and Technology Complex here in Binian Laguna. Uh, we have established a direct 
material supplier access and also equipment manufacturers in the world we don't deal with middle person or like the middleman here thus we actually obtain like the, the most competitive pricing as well as direct service quality uh, again uh, one thing that touched my heart here is actually uh, we're the only uh, say, uh, startup company uh, who were invited by BMW uh, in its first reverse trade fair. So just to give you an idea what is the Philippine reverse trade fair, uh, the, the, the BOI is inviting BMW to put up a facility here such that it will manufacture the e-cars in the Philippines. But to do that, BMW uh, made a deep dive to the supply chain of the Philippines. So. From there, uh, so it invited all the automotive companies from that industry here in the Philippines. And it so happened that we have the capability for advanced polymer, so we can actually produce it. And our material is very suited for that. So uh, BMW was surprised that there is this capability. And we're the only company with that capability and the rest are actually more than a decade old and they are more into metal fabrication. So, so to speak, as of today, we launched already three nanomaterial products commercially here and abroad. And currently, we have eight IPs in our portfolio. So uh, as what uh, the first speaker said, uh, Mr. Carlito Lebrilla, so we're using actually trade secret for now. But these are actually patent transferable. Now, for the challenges, so to speak, uh, uh, there are like three challenges for a startup, so mainly we will be looking at first is the funding. So for the funding, it is an acid test to commercialize your idea to become a product. And for our case, it took us almost like two years before we even get started, you know, these, uh, the pilot production. Second is that your supplier, it, it is very crucial that you have your suppliers for your upstreams and also your downstream because they play a critical role in your, you know, uh, supply chain or in the processes. So. Having a product to offer is one thing, but your ability uh, to keep your product in the market for your customer is another. So that's the most crucial. The next is actually the customer. So uh, all three are crucial and important. So if you know your product well, you must know also who are your customers because your ability to define your right customer defines the next step, the next step towards getting that first order and also your repeat orders and your revenue stream. Now, when we look at the lessons learned during our journey, uh, the first thing that I would recommend for say startup who would be doing similar path, uh, first is find a, very, a good mentor. So a very good mentor. In our journey so far, we've been fortunate enough to have good mentors that help us to be where we are right now. So regardless if that's from say, on the scientific standpoint, at the business standpoint, on the customer standpoint. So your mentor is crucial. Second, do not be afraid to ask. So ask for help, ask for questions, ask for say expertise, you know, advice coming from people who are say more experienced than you are or have been there uh, in the business. And then also ask the right question to your customer. Uh, third is the partners. So Find the best suppliers and manufacturers, by the way, uh, both in your upstream and your downstream. So the technologies that they will bring uh, into your, uh, say, product or into your processes would be crucial for you to be uh, efficient because the efficiency right now translates also to the value or to the cost of your product. Uh, the next one is that you must continuously innovate. So the product that we have right now is only as good as you know, for it's only good for two years. So I, I've been in the semiconductor in the, uh, industry space. So I've done new product introduction and also process engineering management. So typically there is just a life cycle. So what, however good your product is and therefore there must be the next product that the customer new and existing one will be actually needing in their future. Uh, third, uh, so, sorry, next one is that you have to look and listen and also work with your customer. Remember, your customer is your most valuable resource in terms of information such that you can actually come up with a potential product or, or services that you can offer. Uh, please note that we're not only offering our nanomaterial products, but also we're offering like custom solution to the customer. So we do actually on the site R&D for them because some companies, they don't have research and development capability. But since we're good actually to bridge our product 
to their requirement and therefore we do this uh, value added services for them uh, the next one is that do not forget by the way to say a network because your network will give you the next opportunity so you can find your next lead your next customer your next market and of course the next sources of funding so with that uh, before i would i would end my presentation i would like to acknowledge by the way the different organization have been supporting us uh, uh, in our journey so doste uh, dost preferred Pilfida and the Department of Agriculture. Uh, so with the Department of Trade and Industry, uh, the Board of Investment, the EMB or the Export Man uh, Marketing Bureau, uh, the different PTIC or the Philippine Trade and Investment Center uh, here in Berlin and also in Mexico and also in Taiwan. So with that, uh, thank you very much and thank you for, your, uh, for listening. Thank you, Jerome. Excellent. Uh, actually, I see on the audience that CP David is uh, part of the uh, group listening to you now. Uh, you're one of his babies when he was featured director. And clearly yeah. this uh, ecosystem has grown tremendously involvement of DTI and EMB. And this that's why I wanted to demonstrate to the uh, young entrepreneurs out there uh, to see what Jerome has gone through uh, in terms of product development, networking, and all the challenges. And I hope you learned something. This is local, guys. This is the way it is. And I hope that uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, create more Jeromes uh, in terms of uh, 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 growing the ecosystem in various areas other than nanotechnology. Uh, but uh, with that, I think uh, we have completed the five uh, 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 company and technopreneur speakers and their various R&D commercialization efforts from very successful ones with actual sales in the US and worldwide to bridging uh, different uh, uh, regulatory and applications as well as local companies. Uh, so I think I would uh, open up the, uh, uh, the floor now for questions and I think uh, since uh, Joel has saved me, I'll give him first dibs <laughs> on the question for Jerome. Right. And uh, for those, we will probably do this for about 10 minutes. And then for those, I saw that some of the questions are already being answered and directed at the chat room. Continue to do that. But uh, uh, if you don't get to ask your question, but uh, for now, we have uh, the Q&A for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Joel, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Al. Uh, all excellent presentations, by the way, by all uh, uh, presenters so far. Uh, Jerome, I got a question for you. You mentioned that uh, your company holds about eight uh, intellectual properties. Uh, tell us what your approach is in terms of applying for patents, uh, because you're trying to plug your company into the global supply chain. So are you applying for patents only in the Philippines, or are you looking into applying for patents uh, in other parts of the world as well? Uh, we're actually considering both because uh, normally there's like a patent restriction or limitation as what the other speakers uh, already shared. So uh, we are considering both a local uh, uh, patent uh, application. So through the uh, Philippine, uh, Philippine uh, patent uh, office here and also we're trying to look at like a patenting or application uh, in the U.S. because U.S. is a global scale and most of the discussions that we have like now are, uh, related to the say the companies that we've been talking to in the Silicon Valley area, uh, it's actually in the U.S. And you know for a fact that U.S. has a more global scope. So we're considering both applications. All right, great. Thank you. I'll have got a quick answer for Gandhi as well, if that's okay. Sure. While you're at it. Okay. So Gandhi, you mentioned your your desire or your company's desire to be able to link up with uh, similar companies in your sector. Uh, for some formal alliances that would be mutually beneficial. And you kind of, I, I gathered from you that you were, were having some challenges on that. And I was wondering whether there's some entity, government, or uh, professional society that could help facilitate that for the members of your sector. What's your take on that? Yeah. So I think that we've had, that there are societies, you know, specifically for pharma manufacturing and pharma quality. You know, right. so we collaborate on that level, um, but from a R&D level, 
we okay. don't have we don't have such now the, the 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 ecosystem that was created by you know a lot of the folks here from Paase and USAID Stride Pishird um, DOS okay. the past couple of years has been helpful right um, especially okay. with the uh, drug discovery program so DOST has been pushing more industry participation so hopefully from there you know we can look at some of the pre-commercialization or pre-competitive uh, activities and we can collaborate on that so we don't have to repeat you know a lot of the bioassay development a correct, lot of correct. validation a lot of the yeah. process development hopefully we can get there so we've started meeting so joey ochave of unilab has 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 started having sessions at unilab okay. to, yeah, like very informal sessions to get some of the industry uh, players out there. So we've met a couple of times already. So I think we're just trying to see how we can get a small project that All we right. can pilot. All right. Yeah. I thought it was important to underscore that particular need because it's, it's a need of the industry uh, members. And I thought that perhaps uh, the OST or USAID Stride can do something to facilitate that and even encourage that so that more members could participate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Al. Okay, thank you very much, Joel. Is there any other burning questions there? Our El Presidente, is she in the audience? Uh, normally, she's one for uh, volunteering to, to do it. But if not, I think I would love to move it forward. We're so far a little bit behind schedule now. Uh, continue asking the questions on the chat room for specific speakers. But I think I will now ask to uh, move from the commercialization to the art in this side so that we can get also the point of view of the school, UP in this case. So I have uh, asked uh, Louis Sison of the UP System Tech Transfer Office to kind of describe the environment in UP now, being the biggest R&D institution uh, in the academia in terms of the challenges as well in translating and supporting commercialization efforts of UP system, UP as a whole, R&D. So, Louis, I hope uh, you're able to connect uh, and be able to do your presentation now. All right. Um, good morning. Uh, good morning, Al. Good morning, everyone. Uh, especially to my... Uh, our uh, colleagues in, in industry and academia. Uh, are, are you able to see my slide? Is that okay? Yes. Okay, and I hope my yes. audio is okay. Yeah, it's um, good. Okay, I'm gonna keep my camera off to uh, keep uh, the bandwidth, uh, uh, to minimize the bandwidth. Okay, uh, so I'll go over some of the initiatives uh, we've implemented in the past couple of years, and then I'll share with you some of the results we've, we've had uh, running those those initiatives to support innovation and technopreneurship on on campus. Oops. Okay, uh, so I'm glad uh, Giselle is here. Uh, this uh, first initiative was uh, we we launched it uh, um, during her uh, administration during her, her time as a uh, Vice President for uh, Academic Affairs. So this is the Invention Disclosure Incentive Award. Uh, as you know, in the university, we're always trying to come up with all sorts of legal uh, ways to provide more to our uh, faculty. And, and this is one of them. Uh, so what we were trying to do here is to match the publication incentive that faculty normally get for you know, publishing in journals and conferences. So we wanted to match that. Uh, to support tech transfer. So uh, we started with a 40,000 peso uh, incentive and uh, with the um, um, support of President Nanicon, uh, we're, we're working to increase this uh, uh, the amount uh, even further. No? Okay, and uh, so, uh, and this wasn't, uh, you know, a guaranteed home run in the beginning. Uh, and we had to, in a way, do door to door to get this program going. Uh, we visit, we uh, visited a lot of campus. We visited individual departments and institutions uh, just to be able to work with the, with the top researchers and, and make sure they interact with us so that we can help them with their uh, technologies. 
So uh, uh, when we started, we had uh, a, a goal and half. Uh, we're past uh, the halfway mark. Uh, I think this is uh, 56 uh, awardees uh, so far, and we've been tracking their progression uh, in terms of the technology readiness uh, uh, level. So uh, I think we have a, a good number past the lab stage. Now. So again, the, the lab stage, lab testing is uh, TRL4. Uh, and then the next stage after that, you start uh, pilot testing and you start uh, scaling up. Okay. Um, we also, of course, the, when you talk about batch and disclosure, the, the, the IP is one of the uh, key outputs. Uh, so we've also been uh, uh, tracking the, uh, the, the filings uh, uh, as well. And so uh, the, the good news is we, we, we have a lot already in, in the pipeline and at, at the various stages of, uh, of uh, filing. Them. Which I hope the, I'm not going to go over the individual uh, cases so much. But I hope just by looking at the, the titles, you get some idea as to the, the different kinds of technologies that uh, we're working on, we're supporting in our portfolio. Okay. Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, commercialization uh, pathways, uh, there's a good number of, of, of spin offs, and I'll highlight a couple of them in a while. Uh, and, and also, there are several that are uh, uh, license, under licensing. And uh, uh, there's a, one case that uh, kind of a public good in, in terms of uh, rolling it out to, uh, to communities. So, so that's uh, an environmental technology for the small scale mining industry. Okay, uh, so some highlights of the, the spin offs. So this one is from uh, uh, UP uh, Visayas, uh, Dr. Garabai. Um, so uh, this is uh, Algacon, uh, after we, so they're spinning it off and, and they're in, uh, they entered into a partnership also with uh, Santa Feed. Okay. And uh, this one is from uh, UP Los Banos. Uh, this is the of the Fasarium uh, uh, wheels. So they also recently uh, reached uh, some and uh, then we also have uh, uh, from Diliman uh, we have uh, uh, one technology um, on uh, e vehicles. Okay, uh, so they they piloted in uh, several sites around the, the country uh, already. And then we have this one that is in environmental technology and uh, AI. So this is uh, Fish Eye, a collaborate, uh, uh, co-founded by uh, uh, professors from uh, 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 our uh, Marine Science Institute and Department of Computer Science uh, prof uh, professors uh, 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 David and uh, and Naval. Okay. Um, so that. Yeah, it's one of our older initiatives in uh, in uh, TTBDO. Uh, a new one that we just launched the, the other year is called the. Uh, this is another uh, excuse for us to give additional financial support to our uh, faculty. Uh, so it, this is uh, unlike the invention disclosure incentive award. This is a more proactive approach in that we provide more intensive mentoring uh, to our. Uh, to our, our researchers now. and we do this even though so typically uh, when, when you talk about invention disclosure you're assuming that there is already you know some technology or, or a lot of r d already uh, already done okay, let me just check if uh, okay um but uh, in, in many cases there there are researchers that you know maybe especially those uh, who just got back maybe from, uh, from their uh, PhD uh, studies, uh, maybe they're just starting out and, and, and they would like to you know, get on the fast track to making an impact uh, and help, and they need help defining an R&D roadmap, okay? Uh, and connecting to, to industry. So, so that's, the, that's the primary purpose of the University Innovation uh, Fellowship, so it's all, one semester renewable uh, uh, program uh, that we started uh, last year. And I'm glad, uh, I think there's at least one uh, fellow here. I think Joyce is, uh, 
uh, is here. Um, and uh, we're also uh, uh, glad that one of our fellows also uh, kind of stepped into a tech transfer role also after our, our the initial work with us as a university innovation fellow, that's Dr. Jong Vasquez. And then we have our, our second batch right now, also from uh, diverse fields. I already mentioned uh, Professor Garibay uh, um, with uh, uh, Algecon. And then we also have uh, Dr. Pangan. And Do Dr. Uh, Pasaporti is working on um, uh, re renewable, renewable plastics and then uh, agricultural feedstocks for, for that. Okay. Um, so how have uh, so this we're we're just on our second batch and we're launching our, our third batch this coming uh, semester and and we're, even with you know a modest uh, pilot uh, we, we've we've got made a lot of progress with uh, with our with our fellows you know? and um, and some of them uh, we've even uh, helped uh, in terms of submitting uh, industry collaboration funding proposals. Okay. Uh, and the last initiative uh, that uh, I, I'm going to walk you through, uh, and this is uh, my other hat uh, as uh, the project leader of the Upscale Innovation Hub. Um, so in addition to supporting spin-off companies and uh, startups, we also launched uh, what we call the uh, Market to Lab. So you might be confused <laughs> initially, Normally we hear of lab to market, no? but uh, this is uh, the, the opposite. So you can think of it as um, market pool. Uh, so we, we talk to we, uh, talk to various industries, uh, try to identify their challenges, and then we match them up with uh, with researchers uh, to to address that might have solutions to those uh, challenges. Okay, and. Uh, we're, we just uh, started our second batch. Uh, we had uh, a few uh, industry uh, collaborations started in our first batch. And in our second batch, um, we were able to uh, submit, uh, I think, nine proposals uh, in, in, in various sectors from, uh, um, from agri-tech to construction, furniture, water and environment. Uh, renewable energy, I think we have uh, two there. Uh, we have one in biomedical devices and we even have one on uh, health and beauty. And that's also in partnership with a uh, social enterprise venture. All right, so, uh, and we're, we're uh, excited about uh, uh, these three uh, initiatives and we're working uh, to you know, scale them up and uh, have more involvement from the uh, not just the the UP community but also our uh, other academic partners so I'd like to uh, thank uh, the CTBDO and upscale team who helped me with, the, with these slides Cedric, Aina Diane, Merdi and of course uh, uh, Al uh, and on the upscale side we have uh, Chris and Ed, uh, uh, Roger one of our senior partners uh, Jane March, G Mark Ma Mari and Ariel, and of course, uh, up, the Upscale Innovation Hub is also uh, supported by uh, DOSD Fishard, and, and I think Eric will uh, talk a bit more about how they're also supporting uh, the innovation ecosystem. All right, so that's, uh, that's my, uh, that's my uh, short talk, and let me know later if you have any questions or uh, please post in the your questions on the chat. Thank you, Louis. Uh, so I hope that the people in the audience have a little bit of a flavor on what UP, uh, actually our group uh, at the Tech Transfer and Business Development Office has been um, uh, pushing for more spin outs. But before you do that, you start with the patents as Carlito described it, uh, and then be able to look at the market and talk to the customers at what that's what Jerome is doing now. And then moving into eventually, hopefully, raising money and venture capital. That's what I hope for. I was at a session of uh, Fisher last week on the other spin out groups that I've been mentoring. And I told them, How are you guys going to stay alive <laughs> uh, during this pandemic uh, lockdown? And a lot of them are still grappling with the idea about what's capital. Uh, 
private capital raising uh, look like. And uh, hopefully uh, we can demonstrate that with Jerome with the help of LaSalle at this point because he's based in LaSalle. But we've done that for UP and I'm hoping that some of the spin-outs, including Prost Naval, who's on the other session today, who wanted to be here, wanted to uh, uh, explore that opportunity considering that we've at least crossed over uh, already from the IP development to the uh, uh, market evaluation. Of course, Ghani has spoken about the regulatory pathways for some of the Tuklas Lunas work. So I hope you're getting a full picture of the ecosystem for those people who are in the audience. And so without much uh, 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 um, questions first, I think we'll probably now go into the other entity that has been very, I mean, this is not because I'm part of it, but has been very helpful in promoting the SNT ecosystem in the country. This is the project USAID Stride. And today we have uh, Richard Abandan, who is the chief of party of uh, Stride 2, to describe to you what Stride is doing now in the last uh, uh, couple of years uh, in terms of our uh, efforts towards promoting entrepreneurship and technology commercialization. So uh, Richard, please take it away. Thank you, Al. Uh, can you hear me and can you see my screen just to confirm? Yes. And yes, I'll be sharing, I'll be turning off my video to save on bandwidth. So uh, good morning, everybody, and good evening to everybody in the US. Uh, I'm really happy here to talk about uh, the DOSC Philippine Innovation Entrepreneurship uh, Core Program. Uh, first, it's really a DOSC program. That's why it's in the title. So really, if anything, my co-presenter should be Dr. Eric also speaking after me. Uh, this is really a DOSD uh, primarily funded project, working with the STRIDE program, working with De La Salle University, uh, with uh, RTI International and GW, on really creating this program. And it's really just to sort, of, sort, of, sort of just go to the headlines. Uh, what's the FEC program? It's really about helping our researchers uh, do market validation early. And so before I go to the, uh, the meat of what uh, the FEC program is all about, uh, again, I think it's something to just want to give you the context about why we're doing this and sort of give you a quick plug about the STRIDE program and the project I represent. Again, we're here to do, uh, to strengthen science, technology, innovation, research capacity for inclusive growth in the Philippines. So you can see here that for that to happen, we really need to have uh, commercialization uh, happen uh, from our research in the universities and our research institutes. So we've been around for the last uh, almost seven years, uh, $38 million just for the Philippines, again, towards inclusive economic growth through STI. And I think, Many of the partners here today, I see a lot of familiar faces. I want to sort of give a quick shout out. Uh, you know, Aliza Virata started me in this uh, journey with Stride, also with Paase, uh, Dr. Bakungis, Ana Villalobos, uh, Irene Villasenor, our partners in Stride, CP David, uh, Crystal Villanueva, uh, Villaluna, Joy Banal is one of our grantees, Joy Sibana, uh, Carlito, I think, I think it's a big part of this effort also. Um, Mylene Leggett, I see here, and Louis, of course, I think we've collaborated a lot. I think it's good Louis started before me because that's a lot of initiatives that I think we are also working together. I want to say quickly that this, uh, it takes a village to really bring about commercialization, right? So I think all the efforts here are really important. We really have to work together. It's, uh, it's a tough effort to get commercialization going. Obviously, Ghani, Al, uh, Giselle, and Joe has been part of the stride effort early on also. So, um, the FEC program, again, is a collaboration between DOS, TPSHER, DLSU, and Stride. And I think we're going to this question about, you know, how do we make S&T research uh, equate to innovation? And we sort of have definition for innovation here about translating ideas and inventions into products and services people are willing to pay. That's the important part, right? That's what commercialization is all about. If there's no willing market, then there's, no, there's really not yet an innovation. And so I think uh, Carlito started this, uh, uh, this session. And it's, it's a good example, right? Where you have a chemist who sort of now is an entrepreneur also. And that, that journey is also not straightforward, right? And it, it's somewhat personality driven, also experience driven. And so I think that's something that with this uh, FEC program, we sort of want to sort of uh, facilitate that transition. And you will also see later on that you don't really have to transform everybody to become an entrepreneur to sort of commercialize our research. And I think that's, I think, the big power of the FEC program. Uh, sort of to throw a wet blanket in terms of this effort on commercialization, uh, I have a graphic here from the AUTM, Association of University Technology Managers in the US. It's a pretty old uh, graphic, 2016. It talks about all the great outcomes from university funded uh, university research, right? Uh, billions of research expenditures, uh, new products created, licensings and revenues, a number of patents. 
but I have another uh, screen grab here on the right. Again, this is relatively old, but I think it still holds true, right? That most universities actually lose money in terms of, if you look at it as a business, in terms of investing in R&D towards commercialization. It says here, you know, only about the top 5% earners are only, you know, eight universities. And uh, sorry, I, I, the, top, the, top, the eight top 5% five, earners uh, took 50% of all licensing income uh, uh, revenue. And uh, the top 10% took 70%. So you can see that most universities in terms of numbers actually don't make a lot of money in commercialization. Also, again, only 37 universities have been able to reach a top 20 in licensing revenue in a given year. So just to show you the sort of difficulty in looking at commercialization, it's not uh, obviously a straightforward journey. Uh, locally in the Philippines, there's a picture of an M&E uh, conference by DOSD that we've helped out in terms of the technical uh, components. Is that, you know, DOSD is also looking at how do we look at the economic impacts of our investments in R&D. And you can see here that I have a red arrow here on the right, on the left here on this row on economic impacts. And so these are the new M&E frameworks for R&D projects in the Philippines. So you can see things like outputs, like patents, they're all there, the usuals. But now we have outcomes like profitability, cluster growth, net investments. So the, these are the new metrics for investments. And I think going forward, our commercialization efforts across everybody here from DOSD, PASE, UP, really will help sort of meet these sort of performance targets. I want to quickly just sort of show that again, it takes a uh, village here. We've done efforts on technology transfer cap capability building in the, in the Philippines with universities, we've gone to the US. We partnered with um, DOSD Fishard also in upscale with Louis here on the KTTO impact program. Again, building technology transfer capabilities in Philippine universities. So that's one part of it, right? And all these are the functions of a KTTO. We're building capabilities in the university here, bringing in services. But now I want to talk about how we want to sort of transform our actual researchers, right? Because that's part of the equation, not just the services, not the tech transfer office, but the researchers have to also have to push this. And again, we also work with many RDIs and TBIs. Again, it's a big ecosystem. Obviously, TBIs play a big role also. So now let me go back to this uh, market validation question and what the Philippine Innovation Entrepreneurship Core Program is all about. And, it, and, and you know, it's prim primarily based on the NSF i -Core, since the name is pretty close. And uh, many of uh, our researchers in the US might be familiar with this. And it sort of asked the question NSF initially, you know, we've been investing about seven and a half billion in US taxpayer dollars in basic research, but how do you start showing outcomes, right? And this is um, something I think even our Philippine government is also beginning to ask. And so taxpayers should be benefiting from uh, commercialization. And, but still there's that sort of impression that researchers weren't developing technologies that cost, meet customer needs. Obviously, basic research also does not have a direct commercialization bed. We know that. So, but to be fair, there's sort of that impression. And so NSF worked with a Stanford Lean Launchpad curriculum to sort of look at how can we do rapid customer discovery to sort of test and validate these research ideas even before it become a spin-off. And so just uh, this is an old statistics. I know it's grown a lot, but since 2010 to 2016, about 905 teams have gone through this in the US with about $105 million raised. So that's the i -Core program in the US. And just to show you this, uh, the, pretty much the main design of this. You form a team around the uh, technical lead, which is your principal investigator. You can imagine your academic researcher or your research institute uh, uh, technical lead. And you actually build a team around that. You build a mentor, you put an entrepreneurial lead to do all the business development pro projects. It doesn't have to be a scientist or an engineer. And I think uh, Louis talked about mentors. We've heard about it from uh, Jerome also, right? About talking to customers, also having a good mentor program. I think it's all here, right? It, it, it's not a new concept by any means, right? And we're trying to so, so put a system to this, but you build a team. That's I think a very important part of this uh, i -Corp program and the FEC program. We're not letting the researcher, primary principal investigator on, on their own. Uh, we build a team where they can actually now supplement and have a synergy in terms of all their different capabilities. So you have a team around it. It takes effort to build these teams, by the way, and Al's been a big part of that. It takes him months of uh, bugging mentors to help out a particular project to be part of the team. In the US, it's actually competitive. You apply for a program, you have a team, uh, you must be an NSF funded researcher. And in our FEC program, it's similar. You must be a DOSD funded uh, researcher. Uh, and then you actually get a sort of a financial incentive to be part of the program in addition to the training. So what is the FEC program or the i -Corp program in, in the US? It's really a one week training first about how you do a, 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 a lean business model or business plan and really doing a lot of rapid customer discovery 
um, efforts, interviews with markets, and that's where this program is all about. Is there's a lot of mentorship involved there also with the team going forward. And finally, there's a sort of a capstone class at the end where they discuss their learnings and refine their business model canvas. Again, this is a US example of a team on the right. You see they're counting interviews, and that's actually the performance metrics of this project. I want to highlight at this point a very important part that we're here to transform the researcher, sure, but you don't have to, right, to become an entrepreneur. There's this team around that, and I think that's very important here because we don't really have to rely on the resources, the time, the energy of our main investigator. They can focus on the research and the technical side. But if you sort of have a sort of immediate startup effect of uh, creating this team around them, something very important to think about. Again, it's based on several principles. We're creating a business model, not a plan. Uh, I, I like this part about, you know, a startup is a temporary organization to test a value proposition, right? So in a way, it's all right if you fail. I think that's something that we always sort of push into our, uh, our startup community, that it's not necessarily always you have to be succeeding at the first time. Obviously, it's an iterative process. We want to create a valuable product. And we sort of have a flipped classroom design where actually the in class, the students are the one reporting most of the time. It's really about getting out of the classroom. It's really about customer development. So sort of again, two elements, the business model canvas. Many of you are familiar with this. It's just a rapid uh, business plan. You have this little canvas where you have to answer these different questions. Who are your customers? How will they get it? And how will I grow my customers? All these different components. And it, it just takes a few days to go through this. And you'll see they actually refine this as they go to teams. But really the big part is a customer development. And that's really just networking and talking to people. And the way you have to force them to talk to people. Uh, just a quick, in, you know, we, we actually got NSF i -Corps certified instructors to come here to run these programs. We ran two batches of these. And again, these are our instructors and also with, along with our instructors from RTI International. We're actually building a local capability here of uh, mentors who can actually sort of, sort of give this kind of training in the future. Just to give an idea again, we ran two of this already, one in 2018, one in 2019, uh, about, uh, about a six, seven week program. Again, the kickoff workshop, a class for a few days, all the uh, forced uh, interviews, I like to use the word forced, uh, and really at the end a capstone course. This is a picture of the batch that was done in DLSU. I think this is the second batch already. And you have uh, Jim Chung on the lower left here uh, working, and that's Bob's story in the uh, lower right uh, during that training program. You see Al in the foreground here because Al's been there. I think that's Louis there also. So you can see, you know, it's all the same, uh, all the same champions in commercialization and really trying to learn from each other here as we go through this program. Again, we've done, we've done two batches of this, and this is the first batch. You see it's different technologies. It's, it spans everything from energy, health, uh, medical devices, uh, Agri, uh, so you can see the sort of the spread of that, and it's, it really initially involved uh, Picard, Pichard, PCHRD projects. Also, uh, later it became more of a Pichard uh, focus. But you can see even DOST institutes like Phil Rice were actually part of this program. So individual teams, again, we built around them uh, these different uh, concepts and uh, products. Just want to show you now quickly sort of some of the teams that we've sort of had in the last two batches. This is like the hybrid electric train. Um, and you can see uh, we have some great outcomes from there. One thing I like to show about this, see they, this, their slide, they actually showed their number of interviews. There's this big push to again, have them have, them, have, them have a lot of interviews. But uh, even the NSF uh, folks were really surprised because we have this team here that before going through a program actually had the train already. So they're really impressed. But uh, one thing that we found out was like, hey, the actual cab length after all these interviews had to be shorter. Right? And so these are big insights you get with talking with customers. Again, a team from Mapua, this will show you the spread of the projects we've had. Uh, this is from UP Las Banas with Apticon. Uh, you can see again that there's a mix of the investigator. We have a tech transfer officer uh, and also an entrepreneur or maybe a, as a mentor. You already need these different components to really create a rich uh, project. This of a DLSU uh, on the exoskeleton, the project Agape. I want to also point out that we can get great industry mentors like Earl Kua here, uh, you, you know, who runs a big uh, semicon firm, because really they can create, they can open doors and uh, uh, give uh, great insights to our teams. So just to sort of now sort of wrap it up now, you know, what are the outcomes, right? And I, I have these three bullets just to sort of in words to show, hey, we've increased technology readiness level. Al can talk a lot about that. You know, uh, one team has found an industry partner. The one about the train shifted their development towards what the Philippine National Railway specifically wanted at that period of time. Uh, for the FEC2 cohort, 
uh, their TRL, some of them have progressed. Uh, one went to have a, a pilot testing in terms of prototyping. One, the one with the tablet, uh, with one of them on the health actually partnered with a pharmaceutical company in evaluating their tablets. Uh, again, there's this increase in readiness in innovation red in, in investment readiness. Uh, Fertigrow is a good example. And I sort of want to just show you two quick things like this, the one with uh, Fertigrow, I believe, on their work with uh, the, uh, the Panama disease. And actually through this FEC program, through their interviews, they were actually able to enable a 5 million grant or funding, I think from this, from SDC, and actually found an industry partner help, uh, that actually helped pilot or sort of do a prototyping, actually opened doors for a soft landing in Thailand. The iron fortified rice project actually is also interesting. They actually realized that they had to actually change their market segment. They were originally looking at a end users, the actual buyers of rice and actually the grain producers, but now they're actually realizing that the LGUs are actually the big uh, uh, market for uh, some of these uh, uh, iron fortified rice. So again, I think uh, those are the concrete outcomes, but I think the bigger, uh, more important outcomes, I think will be the, how the, the realizations of our researchers and the teams, right? And we actually ask, what are your aha moments? And, you know, besides a partnership, it's about realizing the different markets that they have, how many interviews are there? Again, we have a statistics here, 234 interviews of 10 teams in three weeks, right? And how they are able to pivot their projects to actually get more funding. You know, and I'll sort of, sort of end with this sort of last couple of slides. With like, you know, these are just quotes about, and we have a video of all these uh, testimonials from our 20 teams. They're like, it's like 15 minutes long. I didn't want to play it. But I sort of took out and paraphrased a few quotes. And you can see it's sort of a mindset change, right? And these, this, is not, this doesn't happen overnight. It takes time, you know this particularly like Louis knows he's working with uh, academic teams, but you know, things like, you know, and now I have to look at all markets. I have to go to the field with clients. Uh, I have actually met our competitors during this pro, uh, during this interviews and actually know about their products. Uh, There's an interesting uh, comment. I, I learned to ask open-ended questions, not yes and no uh, questions, but actually something where we can actually learn more from our customers. I learned increasing our partnerships with LGUs. We expand our thinking, not just looking at the local market. I think this is for the hybrid electric train actually, where now they were saying, we, we can actually just export some of the components. Um, and again, it's something about learning about understanding the market, right? As scientists, we don't think about it too much maybe, but really that the market rules at the end of the day. So these are the realizations. I think that's hard to capture with numbers. That's something we could uh, um, bring out from this FTC program. So find, uh, learnings, I think finding, you know, it's great, looks great, but there are difficulties to do this. Primarily finding principal invest investigators who are really interested in doing this and forming a, a team around them is not easy. You need a good dynamic between all these uh, members. Uh, and many teams have to be encouraged to do more of these interviews because, you know, some people are uncomfortable trying to just do a cold call, right? And so how do I get to these networks? That's what this program is all about. It's really encouragement and mentorship. And sometimes this uh, some good old fashioned pushing. Uh, and really, uh, how do we define the success of this kind of training? And even the other similar trainings uh, that Louis talked about and maybe around TBIs, tech transfer, you know, the, the outcomes of these won't happen quickly, right? And so we can look at TRLs, licensing, sure. But how about the teams that sort of realize, hey, my product may not be the best thing right now. I have to go back to the drawing board. I have to make a large pivot. You know, are they a failure or a success? I know, I think for us, it's also a success, right? You know, why would we start investing more when we can actually transition and do a better product in the future? So I think this, this kinds of learning is something we have to sort of build in as we metrics, do the metrics on this kinds of work. Uh, finally, why do you wanna do this? Again, we wanna create more startups, uh, design more research that meets industry needs, make our students and researchers more entrepreneurial. And again, these are common goals across all our programs here, across Stride, PASE, and DOSD and other partners in UP and academics. Uh, I want to end with this one last slide. You know, fine, we're doing all these programs on tech transfer, TBIs, market validation training like the FEC program. But, you know, we also have to ask, we're targeting people here, right? But how can we also uh, change our structures in academic institutions and research institutions to meet the challenges of innovation? And so for the STRIDE program, that's why I sort of made a little shout out to all the different people here in this group that's been part of the STRIDE program. FTC is not just, it's a small part of it, but we're also working on innovation readiness with our HEIs, policies on incentives and extension, uh, more efficient research operations, new metrics for R&D, as I mentioned, mechanisms to better engage industry. To, to, to your point, Joel, we'll be happy to keep working with everybody on how do we sort of, you know, uh, 
solve the riddle of industry academe partnerships. But I think we'll, we'll still be here for almost another year. So uh, we'll be happy to work with you all and give us ideas on how we go through this uh, program. So that's it. Um, thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions and discuss this in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. I almost got kicked out again. So, uh, but clearly, again, this is another one of those that we were talking about FEC at the last Paase meeting in 2017, just describing the program to our group. And in 2018, we implemented the first FEC and a second cohort. We were supposed to have a third one this uh, year, but unfortunately with COVID, it was very difficult to recruit teams. You said we'd have to go meet them individually and encourage them to take on to the program. <laughs> Hopefully with this presentation, a lot of you guys in the audience will start considering taking part of FEC3 when it comes online next year. And I hope Eric is in the audience will support it as well, uh, moving forward beyond uh, the life of strike. So I think with that, uh, we will save the questions for Richard. We will try to uh, get uh, uh, Fisher Director Eric putting it next. And then we will have a Q&A after that. We're running a little bit behind schedule. Hopefully, you guys stay on and uh, get to ask your questions either in the chat room or in person if you wait a little longer after Eric's presentation. So, Eric, uh, please take it away. Yes, good, good morning to everyone. Thank you very much, Al, for the invitation and also to the members of us. I hope you can uh, hear me fine. Uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, currently at home, obviously. Uh, because of the ECQ, but I have to share my resources with uh, with kids and uh, <laughs> so I hope my uh, screen is okay. So I'm gonna share uh, the easy thing about uh, what I'm going to present is that uh, most of the things that uh, are what I need to to say was already presented by my uh, that came before me. Uh, which had, uh, uh, I appreciate that uh, they had already shared some of the things that we're uh, doing at, uh, at the UST and particularly at the shirt. And of course, uh, support for uh, research and development and other programs that will uh, support uh, the development of human resources in, in, and institutions in the, for uh, science and technology. But uh, of course, uh, lately, We've been uh, heavily uh, supporting initiatives to ensure that uh, our technologies uh, come out and be used and be uh, utilized uh, by the public, no? whether this is our, uh, to be used by uh, our uh, key industries uh, or uh, budding entrepreneurs who might have interest in uh, uh, putting up businesses that are related to uh, recent s and developments. And uh, this uh, slide shows uh, basically how we're sort of uh, viewing the relationships between us as a uh, part of the government. We provide uh, funding. Uh, we set out the policies and plans for uh, research and development uh, based on what we thought uh, or what we think the market and the industry uh, 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 tells us. No? and also prospecting on uh, uh, future uh, areas where we uh, might need uh, collaborations. So uh, startups and spin-offs now uh, hold a very special place in our, uh, uh, in our heart, no? as, as seen in the previous slides. Uh, we've uh, come up with uh, special programs for them uh, through the years. And I'll tell you uh, some of these things in the next few slides. But more so, there's been a uh, greater impetus for uh, our uh, doing all of this because of the uh, Innovative Startup Act, as you have known, uh, as you uh, well know, have been passed into law uh, just last year. So the DICT, DTI, and the UST have, uh, have come up with the short uh, guidelines uh, that will enable us to access, that will enable uh, entrepreneurs to access uh, funds uh, through startup grants, uh, joint ventures, and uh, even setting up of uh, startup uh, ecosomes. Uh, but this effort is not uh, really uh, new to us because we have had uh, uh, programs and uh, projects deployed, of course, in cooperation with uh, 
uh, various uh, support support groups like of course uh, USA through uh, uh, through uh, the Stride program. Uh, Richard uh, has very well uh, described the, the, his experiences in uh, working with us uh, in these efforts, uh, as well as the continuing efforts to uh, capacitate uh, not, not only us as the research um, uh, council, but also uh, also our researchers, uh, uh, which are being transformed uh, slowly but surely into uh, uh, entrepreneurs and of course the host universities and institutions that uh, nurture them uh, because we wanted to provide a, um, a uh, whole experience in creating this uh, innovation ecosystem. Uh, we likewise uh, had uh, supported the, uh, the startups through additional research grants so that uh, their uh, uh, products that are coming out of R&D eventually uh, find their way into uh, into market and uh, and of course uh, you have uh, the technology business incubators and uh, that are being uh, being put up uh, everywhere in the country uh, through uh, its uh, various uh, programs. Um, for those uh, startups that are coming off from uh, universities. We have established this program <clears throat> to uh, commercialize uh, those that are uh, DOSC funded, particularly uh, coming the, the, from uh, Pichard. And uh, these are designed basically to translate uh, these research outputs into market-ready products, or at least simulate operations of a startup company. So this will encourage uh, researchers to pursue commercialization efforts for their uh, technologies. Um, it has been running for uh, what? Uh, two or three years now, uh, because some of them are uh, the, uh, the uh, startups are not uh, starting at the same time. Uh, but uh, at least we now see uh, some encouraging uh, signs that we are indeed uh, coming up with uh, numbers that are uh, uh, encouraging. And uh, we'd like to see more of these uh, spin offs uh, coming out and uh, take on uh, the real challenge of putting out uh, the, te the technologies into real world ap applications and within the consciousness of the public. So just, uh, I'm just going to run through the examples that are uh, coming uh, uh, from spin-ups that are coming from uh, Bigger Mean. You have uh, Asher marketing their products. Uh, uh, for uh, monitoring uh, structures. You have FishEye, which was mentioned earlier, under uh, Dr. Uh, Pros Nabal. Uh, Smart Surface uh, uh, presented this, uh, this uh, spin off product from uh, uh, one of his products. Uh, uh, and then uh, Charm, which is a fast charging. Uh, Equipment that's now currently being integrated into the electric vehicle, electric uh, 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 that were uh, procured or purchased through uh, DOE funds. Uh, it's getting the best of uh, many uh, projects being rolled out by various uh, uh, agencies of government. And then you have technologies that are coming off uh, for to support of, of course uh, government perform its role uh, such as traffic management uh, you have one uh, for that supports uh, uh, our uh, marine and uh, uh, for uh, monitoring and uh, mapping uh, you have uh, fruit tech, which is a uh, formulations applied to uh, fresh fruits to take the ripening process uh, from uh, UPLB. And uh, Guitar One has uh, spun its project from the university. So we've been uh, projects or uh, industries that are related to uh, on the, the creative side. And of course, you have uh, non-encapsulated plant growth uh, regulators. So these are just, uh, I was going through this uh, rundown of uh, startups, uh, trying to find um, commonalities uh, between them and trying to find uh, what made them uh, uh, go ahead 
uh, with their uh, initial uh, breakthroughs and successes, at least in uh, commercialization. Now, uh, one of the identified uh, pain points in having this commercialized is uh, having to engage the uh, universities to prepare also uh, the technology uh, by protecting and uh, make, make, making sure that uh, policies and processes are in place to transfer the technologies because these are technologies that are after all uh, developed uh, uh, through university uh, resources. So in the impact program, uh, uh, does exactly this and uh, you have uh, uh, universities that are being assisted, uh, assisted through the KTTO impact programs with eight uh, grantees. Uh, aside from that, we also have, of course, our uh, startup uh, research uh, programs, uh, which now supports uh, our uh, startups to overcome uh, uh, development roadmap and to, of course, strengthen their intellectual property. This is, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, folk, this program is focused mainly on those technologies that have been created outside the uh, university uh, uh, support uh, ecosystem. So these are the accomplishments and numbers. And uh, this slide shows the uh, grantees that have been uh, recipients of the products. Uh, Jerome was here earlier to present uh, uh, their, uh, his uh, journey uh, with Nanotronics and we're quite uh, pleased with the road that he's taken and the accomplishments that he uh, uh, shared with us, uh, which I hope will also inspire others to uh, persevere. No? Uh, we understand that uh, uh, these are, there are challenges uh, that uh, uh, went along the way and uh, it so happened, of course, that the uh, support uh, uh, coming from the different groups, uh, us uh, from the government, the OST, DTI, as well as uh, uh, USAID Stride uh, through their mentorship programs where we were able to uh, help him through. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so these are just examples of those uh, startups which we uh, supported. Uh, I just highlighted a few because I think uh, some of these will have uh, a pivotal role in how we deal with the uh, new normal. Uh, we thought that some of these startups might uh, have uh, some uh, initial challenges in getting uh, markets uh, uh, ready, uh, but uh, with the, within the context, I think, of the pandemic, it became more, um, uh, it, it became more apparent that they appear to be more marketable, they have more uh, traction in the online market because of their ability to uh, provide uh, digital solutions. And this is the message that I'd like to uh, send also out to those who are starting out as to our uh, budding startups because uh, uh, we would like them to pivot into areas where they think, uh, where we all think would uh, thrive under uh, this, uh, uh, under the current conditions. Another program is, of course, our higher education institution readiness for innovation and technopreneurship. Uh, this is uh, basically our TBI uh, development uh, program, uh, which is aimed essentially to put up these uh, business incubators in uh, uh, universities. Uh, I think uh, we have now have 30 that's already working within the last uh, three uh, uh, months or so. So uh, through this, we hope to uh, increase the capabilities of existing uh, of, uh, uh, of the TBIs uh, and uh, provide the avenues to be, for them to uh, be uh, uh, present or visible on the international market. So for TBI 4.0, the aim is essentially to link up uh, this, uh, those TBIs that had uh, gone on earlier to be developed to not only be present uh, locally, but also internationally. So this is done essentially through partnerships with other um, TBIs, uh, active TBIs all throughout the world. Uh, currently, this is meeting some also challenges because of the restrictions uh, due to travel. So I think they're continuing on to with their partnership 
with uh, other uh, TBIs elsewhere in the world through uh, all of these uh, online uh, engagements. Uh, so far, uh, these are the accomplishments in numbers of the TBI 4.0 program. Uh, UBF scale is actually part of, part of this. And uh, as we were monitoring all of these uh, activities, uh, the numbers alone that we get from 2019 is quite encouraging. There have been many uh, questions on what the uh, uh, innovation in startup ecosystem had uh, accomplished uh, through the years. And uh, for, for simplicity, uh, we are currently looking at these key uh, metrics for us to use so that uh, we will be guided uh, on the uh, performance as well as on the capabilities of our startups and the uh, TBIs that are, uh, uh, that are hosting them. So this can be uh, shown by the numbers of, the, of startups that were incubated, that uh, uh, startups that have uh, transformed into full-blown companies, uh, maybe they can also be gauged by the number of jobs that they created along the way, which is what, uh, uh, what uh, our uh, intentions are. And then, of course, uh, we are uh, monitoring uh, uh, investments uh, that came their way and the uh, revenues that they have uh, also collected. Uh, I mentioned uh, in passing through uh, the slides uh, some of the key challenges that uh, our startups and uh, innovators are facing, especially those that are coming off from uh, research and development institution, institutes or uh, from higher educational institutions. Uh, I observed that uh, there's a really a, a need uh, to, for, for us to be able to assist them develop their uh, uh, develop a real understanding of market uh, needs and prospects. Uh, some of the regulatory requirements, uh, the ways on how to uh, really start up their business are some of the uh, key pain points. The, the, it seems that technology has taken a backseat in all of this when, uh, uh, when they come to this stage where they have to uh, now uh, overcome the administrative and uh, uh, challenges related to uh, establishing their uh, presence in the market. Uh, so to make this easier for all of them, is we need to uh, start, uh, start them early by, uh, shifting, by shifting or transitioning the way how our researchers think from a uh, basically an R&D, R uh, a purely R&D um, uh, approach to uh, a possibility of including uh, uh, technopreneurial uh, uh, foresights in their uh, uh, activities. So also uh, we thought uh, it would help if uh, our uh, innovators, our researchers uh, have an immediate uh, knowledge or information of the different programs on uh, programs that we have uh, in order to support them because uh, uh, the earlier that we engage them in their uh, activities, the better it is uh, for us to be able to uh, find the uh, programs that are more appropriate according to their uh, level of uh, readiness. And of course, I, as I've already mentioned, the new normal poses uh, a lot of these uh, challenges. Uh, some actually see this uh, new normal as an opportunity. And in fact, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, some are now uh, thriving because of the uh, suitability of their systems uh, in the context of uh, new normal uh, uh, conditions. Um, we, uh, in the next few, well, we hope that we're going to really now come, come up with the final version of the guidelines uh, for startup grants uh, specific to the UST. There's a, uh, we are trying to, I think the only the, the, the last remaining uh, uh, portions which we are trying to uh, reconcile is to make it uh, consistent with our r and uh, uh, guidelines in order for them not to, uh, to be more uh, consistent with each other. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we, need, we ought to develop uh, programs uh, that uh, put in place uh, 
R&D and entrepreneurship uh, coming in together so that uh, this will facilitate the uh, uh, adoption of technologies. Uh, we also wanted to promote uh, uh, access to laboratory testing facilities. I'm uh, speaking uh, particularly here of those that are present in the uh, university, uh, in, in the DOST uh, laboratories, because uh, also we, want, we also want to encourage our uh, uh, innovators to, uh, to extensively uh, uh, take advantage of these facilities as they uh, go through their development uh, stages. Um, to come up with uh, products that will uh, really pass through uh, uh, market uh, market uh, uh, requirements and uh, also meet the regulatory uh, uh, requirements. Uh, also, uh, we thought that uh, we need to also improve our linkage programs through partnership with other government agencies, perhaps. Uh, DTI has been a very strong partner. We also wanted to ensure that we have uh, the same uh, uh, strong relationships with other uh, government agencies in order for, for us to accelerate the process of finding industry partners for our innovators, uh, ensure that there's a uh, supply, steady supply of uh, materials uh, for them to be able to use and uh, maybe provide incentives for, uh, so that they get the, uh, good access to, uh, to supply that they need to uh, uh, produce their uh, products, and then also a uh, way for them to find uh, customers. <clears throat> I think that uh, that will be my last slide. Again, thank you very much to Paasi for this invitation. Uh, Al has been very supportive. I'd like to also uh, uh, give gratitude to uh, the speakers that uh, came before me because uh, they uh, really uh, had been very active and supportive to uh, the cause of uh, innovation and uh, entrepreneurship in the country. And uh, the, with them, uh, with, uh, the OST would not have uh, done it uh, alone. So we uh, truly appreciate their uh, contributions. Thank you very much again uh, for the invitation. Good morning. Thank you, Eric. And this, actually, you are the last piece of the puzzle for today, uh, given that uh, Everyone's well represented, not only from the companies, from the big, well established, all the way down to the small, starting out to academia, government, and of course, USAID's right in the middle uh, that has greatly helped our ecosystem in science and technology in the country. Uh, you're all, congratulations to you all. Thank you again very much for coming and presenting to our session on R&D commercialization and technopreneurship. Uh, now I think I can open the floor for questions. Uh, if you guys are, are nice enough to stay, uh, I think we still have quite a bit of audience uh, uh, left. Uh, I think we have so far 80 people still uh, remaining with the past 15 minutes of our time. So uh, maybe a point man in terms of the questions. Can you please start? <laughs> Al, I've got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, thanks again for all the presenters. Excellent presentations. Uh, Richard, I'd like to start with you. And I think this is relevant for Enrico as well. Uh, i -Corps is really an excellent uh, program. And I had the opportunity to participate in that uh, program here in the US. Uh, the way it's done in the US is that we have uh, regional hubs or trainings. Uh, spots and the University of Arizona is one of them. And then after that, we're encouraged to go to Washington DC for the national uh, uh, training, which is more intensive. And because of time commitment, I didn't apply last year. But uh, you mentioned that USAID is going to be there only for another year or so, at least for the current program. Is there any plan for the I Corps program? Uh, that you started to be turned over, say, to uh, U.S., I mean, to uh, the Department of Science and Technology, given that it's really a, a highly valuable program. And Enrico mentioned that uh, there is a need actually for uh, the TBIs to get to know more of their customer uh, needs. And I think that's very much covered in I-Corps. So uh, please tell us your thoughts. 
Uh, I'll go first then. Thanks, Joel, for that question. It's actually a question that we've been uh, pondering for the last year or so also. So yes, primarily it's a DOSE program already. So there's nothing to hand over because it's really theirs. Oh, okay. uh, they funded most of it. We funded part of it. Uh, we gave some technical assistance. So I think we, prior to the pandemic, uh, our plan was actually to apply for a new program which we shared together. We'll actually build a train the trainer component where we'll actually have a formal, yeah. like an NSF, because I believe i has a formal training program, like you're a certified instructor. Right. So we would like to have that local capability and just do it ourselves. Uh, yeah. In essence, we have the right people already, even in this room, Correct. we could we'll have to have that same branding per se. So yes, I think um, the, it's just a funding right now, it's a question of how we run it. But I think with Stride being around for a bit more, we can try to support it somewhat indirectly. And to your point about regional, I think Al would chime in here because he was a big promoter of this. He really wanted to put this out where you can bring the training locally. You don't have to go to Manila to take, to take an FTC program, right? And there's a lot of budding researchers there who are looking into entrepreneurship, but maybe don't know how the first step is. This is sort of like a team-based approach, right? So yes, uh, that's in the works. Uh, we value that, but I think there's some funding consideration I have to think about and also how we run it out. But I think the capability is here. So even if we are not able to run it directly ourselves with DOSD, I believe the players here, DOSD also can sort of do this independently later on. Right, thank you. Enrico, do you have any comments for that? Because you mentioned about this regional, originally distributed TBIs. And I think that this would really uh, agree with, uh, with, with that plan. Okay, maybe we we'll lost yeah. there. Sorry, thank you for the question. Yeah, <laughs> I was, uh, was already speaking earlier, but I was muted. Uh, yes, uh, there are now 30 uh, technology business incubators that are running all throughout the country. So this will enable also our uh, uh, budding innovators in those regions to have access to the benefits of uh, having a, an incubator in place to uh, support their uh, uh, their work and the you know the the needs that they have as uh, budding entrepreneurs. We uh, uh, of course part of uh, the challenge that we have uh, in that area is to also prepare these uh, technology business incubators. That's why we also have a mentoring program that uh, that uh, matches of course our uh, more mature uh, TBIs with uh, those that are starting off so that they can uh, be oriented on how to properly guide and uh, nurture their uh, TBIs in the, in the regions. Uh, you mentioned earlier about that uh, customer search. Uh, maybe in, in this context, uh, we also need to provide, uh, well, uh, maybe the challenge here is how to also ensure that the startups know their TBIs and what TBIs uh, will right. best uh, fit them. In some cases, actually, we'll have something like, you know, two, two or three, even three TBIs in one region. And they actually have a choice of which uh, TBI uh, that they can uh, be incubated in. It's not, it's not necessarily in the same university where perhaps the researchers came from. Sometimes it's a matter yeah. of where, what theme is the TBI spousing. So it's, it's one of the, I think, the features of this TBI program that they uh, uh, that they carry a theme, specific theme, so that uh, it will also have some some uh, show focus in uh, what they do and what kind of uh, uh, projects they hope to also support. Thank you. Thank you. Al, I've got one last question for uh, Louis, if that's okay. That's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Louis, I, I like your uh, upscale program, which is the market to lab. And I think that this really directly addresses what Gani Padolina was, uh, was mentioning before, uh, to have the sort of industry alliance to be able to support one another in terms of R&D. But my question really is, and, and my understanding is currently you're addressing uh, local companies here. But talking sure. now about a globalized uh, innovation ecosystem based in the Philippines, do you do you have any plans to extend this as well to global companies that have manufacturing capabilities in the Philippines, and perhaps yeah. to incentivize them okay. to have R and D cooperation with UP and other universities in the Philippines? 
yes, definitely. That's uh, that's in our in our, our road map, and uh, I, I think we're in good shape to accommodate that, uh, uh, especially as we streamline our processes and 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 make sure uh, that we don't have any hiccups, you know, legal and technical al along the way. No? So I, I think we're we're in pretty good shape uh, to accommodate. Uh, those opportunities. So you know, just let us know <laughs> uh, if you can. We would appreciate any you know any leads or referrals for collaboration. Well, my recommendation for you would be to to link up with uh, the Board of Investments or the Department of Trade and Industry because right. they're the ones with the direct contact with these global companies that are entering in the Philippines. I think that linkage there, communication, would be really uh, quite uh, productive and fruitful. But, but yeah, thank you. I think you're doing the right advice. thing. Thanks. That's that's great advice. Yeah, we are working with our senior partners to uh, expand from our current pilot uh, uh, partnerships into you know something that will really uh, scale up. That's good advice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, actually, Joel. We just had BOI the Chosa in UP uh, upscale present about the opportunities for the Board of Investments for registration for startup companies. But it's a good point that we need to tie in our offerings in the academia to show the true breadth of the ecosystem in the Philippines, not only DOST, but UP right. and DTI. And I have Secretary Pernia and the audience who would have been headed the Innovation Council for us to uh, invite exactly this is your dream joel i remember at the uh, 2018 in our meetings in in, in malacanang and in in, uh, in uh, uh, neda with secretary pernia and i've yet to uh, feel that we are nudging or getting closer to it but clearly with this pandemic hopefully with the uh, comfort of people talking by zoom now and not having to travel and being able to establish uh, contacts and connections to these companies like Anvil de Lobos is a good lead to Johnson & Johnson. You probably could be a good lead for uh, Arizona, Carlito, and California. Uh, again, Paase can be very instrumental in promoting this global uh, S&P ecosystem. And I think that's probably our next, if not our game, in the, in the future. And I hope everyone in the audience can see what they want to do when they grow up maybe a Carlito and they grow up, or they can start being a Jerome first or collaborate with Gianni first. And of course, Eric will help them. And if they need teaching a little bit, maybe they can get courses from Louis group. But this is the way an ecosystem works, guys. So I'm so happy that a lot of you stayed in the, uh, in the audience. And clearly, this is just the beginning. I always tell everyone, and I hope uh, maybe Secretary Perja, Doc, uh, Secretary Ernie, can you say something <laughs> yes, yes, in uh, your efforts uh, all these years yes. yeah uh, uh, yeah just uh, a very simple uh, quick question uh, al uh, dr al yes. uh, uh, this has to do with uh, i think the question can be answered by someone from the ost or the or pshared uh, i'm interested in uh, well it looks like uh, you know from the many presentations we have had yeah, during this uh, Paase months, there have been so much uh, activity uh, going going on, and uh, really uh, looks like uh, science and technology innovation is really getting a second life. Uh, as I've said in the in my uh, talk earlier, uh, you know, life begins at forty, and uh, since Paase is already forty years old. I think it, 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 in its second life, it can really be more active, more energetic, and more productive. Anyway, my question is uh, just uh, not, not, not technical, but just uh, financial and maybe economic. Uh, you know, in the past, uh, the figure that uh, has been, had been coming out in terms of uh, government support to science and technology and innovation or R&D, was only around 0.15%. I wonder, uh, under this uh, under DOST, I know that DOST has been much more active compared with previous DOSTs. 
I wonder if uh, this uh, number has uh, has risen, has improved. And the other thing, the other, this, the uh, an interrelated question is: uh, given that so many private uh, companies are interacting, or you know, the researchers are in, interacting with private sector companies, uh, is government able? Is government through DOST, DTI, or NEDA, whatever, uh, is it able to uh, stimulate or catalyze uh, more funding for you know for science and technology research and development, uh, innovation, and so on? Just just to, those those two questions, because uh, funding is always important to get uh, the to get our. Uh, science and technology innovation ecosystem uh, really become self-sustaining in the future. Thank you. Uh, Eric, do you uh, care to uh, answer Secretary Puerna's question? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Secretary, for your uh, remarks about uh, the level of activity that the UST has, uh, has uh, uh, feared no? uh, uh, through the years. Uh, we'd like to believe that uh, it's through the you know the strong support also of our uh, uh, partners in government that uh, we are able to realize uh, and of course from, from the private sector and the various organizations as as uh, in uh, getting this done. Uh, but uh, if you look at the statistics of uh, the UST, actually you would see that in the last uh, three years or so, uh, the total budget of the Department of Science and Technology had been uh, truly flat, not around. 2021 uh, billion pesos uh, annually. So that has been our uh, peg. And uh, I think in the last uh, few years, especially in this administration, we've been uh, really working very hard to uh, pitch uh, through the DBM that uh, our budgets be increased, particularly in, uh, for uh, research and development. Because our operations are mainly flat, but uh, uh, we wanted to provide more opportunities for our researchers, for our research facilities, for our startups and innovators to have more uh, opportunities for them to uh, further develop uh, their uh, technologies to gain traction in the market. So, uh, yun po talaga ang kwento. And then uh, on your second question, if whether there had been uh, uh, strong support for uh, research and development, uh, uh, particularly for uh, startups and innovators, uh, that's what uh, we just came up with. Uh, we uh, uh, implement, uh, we uh, came up with uh, implementing rules and regulations jointly uh, with uh, the ICT and uh, DTI uh, just last year, a few months after uh, the Innovative Startup Act was uh, passed. And then we are now coming up with uh, specific guidelines on uh, Startup venture fund on startup uh, grants, uh, which uh, actually focus on <coughs> our uh, needs in these areas. So we were just caught uh, un, uh, uh, not ready, you know, coming from the 2020, oh, no, sorry, from the 2019 to 2020 budget uh, cycle. We had uh, not yet uh, prepared for it, but hopefully in the next, uh, in the coming year, 2021. Uh, we already included the uh, plans and programs that will incorporate uh, activities uh, to be uh, more actively uh, supporting uh, startup, uh, uh, startup and uh, innovation uh, activities uh, so that uh, you, you know, uh, our uh, innovators will have more access to this as we uh, proceed with their, uh, no, with their uh, activities. Is the, is, the num is the number 0.15% of GDP? Is that already <laughs> rising? Is it closer to 1% of GDP? 1%. <laughs> no, we, we, need, we, we, need, we need to record that so you know, we can compare ourselves with our ASEAN uh, neighbor countries, comparison uh, neighbor countries in ASEAN. We need to have that kind of information. Yes, sir. Uh, if you compare, actually, that's a little bit lower. It's, I think uh, zero, the, the, I think the number would be something like zero point uh, uh, one four <laughs> percent of the GDP. And because the our total budget has not been rising, 
So the denominator, uh, but the denominator keeps on uh, increasing. Uh, it's actually getting lower. So unless we uh, really have a uh, a uh, remarkable uh, increase in our budget, we will not be able to uh, realize those uh, uh, increase in that uh, uh, GDP uh, GDP ratio, uh, R and D spending or S and T spending to GDP ratio. No, no, but I think you should also record uh, the counterpart fund funding from uh, private sector, from the private sector, or from other universities, uh, either public or private, in terms of this whole effort of yes, uh, you know, science and technology uh, innovation. Yes. Yes, Mr. Secretary, that's a, that's a very good uh, suggestion. In fact, in uh, most, uh, well, now in our uh, systems for accepting proposals and monitoring uh, projects, we now see to it that the counterpart uh, funding and uh, support, uh, collaborative uh, support uh, coming from uh, uh, partners uh, is also included in the accounting of uh, uh, expenses and uh, funds in the programs because uh, we noticed really that uh, we are sort of discounting also our uh, partners' uh, contribution. So this is a good way for us. Uh, when I say uh, having a system, I mean we are already uh, putting it in our uh, monitoring system. Uh, and this, is a, uh, this, will also, this will enable us also to report uh, such figures in a, you know, in a uh, more com comprehensive and reliable manner. Thank you for, for pointing it out. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Secretary Bernia. Thank you. Actually, that was part of the question that I asked at the economic session last Monday with uh, Jeff Dukanis. If we, uh, DOST or DTI in the Innovation Fund can actually match private sector investment in startups and techno entrepreneurship oh, yeah. uh, efforts. And that's exactly, I don't know, Vic, do you want to add to that? Is there yeah, something so, like that in Australia? Yes, yeah, so Australia, the way it's done is, so you have your R&D, your expenditure, that at the end of the year, you declare it, and then the government reimburses 43%. Wow. <laughs> so it's nice. almost like, yeah, you put in money, money you get like 50-50, but then there's already, you essentially showed skin in the game, but then the yeah. government respends. So that would help you the uh, what do you call that accounting as well so the government can then track how much they give gave as well then because that's corresponding to actual investment of the uh, private company on its r d perfect that's well i mean I'm, I'm a product of the us sbir program where we i get initial grants in 97 to start my company and uh, for me uh net carry over nolco net uh, loss carry over was very critical and, and time for our investments as well when we were raising Series A, Series B and declaring our profitability. So clearly uh, there are some economic uh, aspects to entrepreneurship that we can look at, but it starts with BOST. Too bad uh, CP uh, David left already because a lot of these efforts were initiated during his time as Fisher Director. I don't know if he's still there, but I want to give a shout out to him because he was early partners with Stride and UP in terms of this effort, uh, uh, even just the conversion to Innovation Council was actually CP's uh, efforts. But uh, I'm so happy that Eric has stepped up to the plate and really getting uh, uh, the monitoring and the evaluation of those uh, companies. I like your last slide, Eric, in terms of amount of investment, jobs created, number of startups is nice, but really it's jobs created and amount of money invested for private sector uh, is the marker for me of in terms of the traction that these technologies are getting. So I think we're past 11, guys. Thank you very much for staying all this time. <laughs> is there yes. any burning last questions out there? Uh, and, uh, or forever hold your peace until the next session. May I? Uh, oh, there. <laughs> El Presidente, we were looking for you. <laughs> well, in the context of us, uh, and um, also, uh, I realized that uh, actually PAS has made a big difference already, Ernie, because so many of our local members have collaborated with our foreign-based uh, members, uh, including uh, 
Jerome with Gobert Advincula. So, uh, Louis, the uh, nano uh, biocomposite materials, I'm glad UP is working on it, but looks like in De La Salle, uh, they are able to bring it to market. So, congratulations, uh, Jerome and uh, De La Salle. Now, I'd like to uh, just uh, point out a uh, revolutionary technology that our co awardee, uh, Dan Tagle, uh, described to us the microphysiology system. And I'm not sure, Ernie, if you were present in that session, but it's uh, to um, um, overcome the obstacles in my area of research. So, my major problem is. Um, while this field of marine drug discovery has always been um, attractive and it's been justified, especially in the Philippines, because we are with the highest marine biodiversity in the world and now we're working with the microbes and we have libraries of extracts, etc. We're not able to move this forward as fast, uh, although Louis is identified the patent applications that I have now for two compounds. But um, I think that uh, Dan described this uh, new um, technology that might change the field of drug discovery. And he also mentioned that companies in the U.S. are actually uh, taking on the technology. And I, in fact, I, I saw Genentech. Uh, was one of them. And so I asked Homer about Genentech, how they're going to uh, get this technology from the NIH and CATS uh, to their companies. But anyway, I think my question to the UP and to the DOST would be, what's a scenario where researchers like us who can't ever be the lead persons in um, preclinical animal trials and uh, human clinical trials for high-value drugs like anti-cancer or antimicrobial or anti-pain, what's a scenario where we could collaborate with, well, it doesn't look like we can do it directly with uh, US NIH and CATS, but I'm talking with uh, Dan about it. But on the other hand, if they're really um, um, uh, sharing this technology under certain terms with private companies like Genentech, What's that scenario where the Philippine government, UP, EOST, would allow us uh, to uh, engage with such companies? Okay, so um, maybe um, Eric can answer that and also uh, Louis. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Giselle. Uh, Dr. Giselle. Uh, well, uh, you know, Jimmy should have been here to answer that question uh, because uh, of course it's easy. But, uh, mainly for us, if, if it's like a uh, technology where uh, the, uh, the partner in this case would be a company who uh, has uh, some stake in the technology, uh, I think it's clear for us that uh, partnerships are still possible. The terms for uh, the intellectual property and technology transfer uh, just needs to be uh, uh, maybe defined properly so that uh, it can it can be a sort of a guide when you uh, start to collaborate and then uh, as your of course your the fruits of your collaboration also mature. Um, we specifically provide, of course, uh, support to the uh, the institution, the, the I mean the uh, the research institution, the local research institution. But at the same time, uh, as I mentioned to uh, Secretary Pernia earlier, we also start to uh, account for the uh, contributions of the uh, partners. So it's a natural. It's a, now becoming a more natural relationship. It's just a It's now just a matter of. Uh, uh, write, writing it down on paper so that uh, it's clear to everyone how the relationship will actually be uh, working as uh, as we go along the the process and even after uh, the uh, the project or the activity has been uh, accomplished. So rest assured, it's it's I think uh, no, it's, uh, it's 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 uh, now becoming a more acceptable uh, arrangement 
in some of our uh, uh, R&D projects. Even at, in, even at smaller scales, we now do that. Uh, perhaps the more uh, extreme, hindi naman siguro extreme, no? but a little bit more extreme cases when we start requiring our uh, researchers to find industry partners before they could actually be uh, be, be allowed or be uh, approved uh, for their uh, research grant. That's, uh, that's one of the scenarios that we're looking. How far are we going ahead into uh, making this a requirement? Uh, it's, uh, it's an evolving process uh, and a discussion among us. Thank you. I'd just like to say that this group is valuable. So I'll, I hope you can keep this group and grow it. So obviously the ones who uh, attended this meeting, this session, are the ones who have, were stakeholders, who were interested in this. So there's no um, uh, stopping having this group meet again and give more talks. So it's going to take a life of its own. And I think yep. at this point, it's important for Joel Kellyan and myself to assert what we think should be a goal, the major goal of the PASE, which is to create those STI ecosystems in our country. And in Joel Kalia's plan, if you recall, it included, of course, academe and then uh, government. And then we also wanted to include MSMEs or SMEs, but we also wanted to include global uh, industry. Is that right, Joel? Yes. Yep. So maybe yep. uh, you can say something about it, Joel, because I think it's critical that um, this kind of um, investment by a, a global or foreign industries would help us. And it's not yeah. a question of piracy, Eric. No, we yeah. are protecting ourselves in terms of our intellectual property. So we've gone a long way in doing this in UP and obviously also in La Salle. And we have uh, the DT, the DOST helping us with your TAPI funding for our uh, patents and patent applications. So maybe a word from Joel regarding this. Okay, so just re real quickly, thank you, uh, Giselle. Uh, so the, the way that we uh, design the ecosystem is uh, it includes, uh, of course, participation of government, of the academe, and private companies as well. Of course, civil society has a say on that as well. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we would like both local companies as well as global companies. And for a developing economy, emerging economy like the Philippines, uh, it really can uh, use uh, infusion of foreign direct investment. And that is through the global companies. And that's where the Department of Trade and Industry, the Board of Investments, in cooperation with the DOSD uh, and ANEDA can really uh, play a uh, pivotal role in making that happen. And also uh, the entrepreneurs in the Philippines, uh, when the global companies are present there, uh, it, they, it would create more opportunities uh, for the startups because they can plug themselves into the value chain, the supply chain of the global companies. Um, and so it's an upward spiral uh, with this ecosystem. Uh, the great thing is that there are already a lot of uh, global corporations present in the Philippines. Uh, quite a lot of them are doing manufacturing, but uh, the missing link is the connection with the research and development uh, for uh, the Philippine ecosystem to really go up the, uh, the ladder of development, uh, there is the R uh, there is the manufacturing, but then there has to be the R and D as well in cooperation with uh, the uh, universities in the Philippines. So when that happens, there's really this upward spiral that takes place, where uh, uh, you have more companies that are local, that are domestic, that are Filipinos, uh, startup companies, small medium enterprises that get plugged into uh, the value system of these global companies. And then after some time, they themselves can create their own companies that become global as well. So in summary, that's really what we're trying to design here, what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, on Monday, in, in the session that we have in the creation of regional uh, science and technology innovation ecosystems, this is precisely what we will be addressing. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Joel. Actually, start with Jerome. <laughs> but thank you very much for uh, staying all this time. We're now past uh, 11.15. I would have to close this session before they cut yeah. us off.
But thank you very much for all your efforts, guys, in making this a very good communicating effort session for everyone. And hope you guys have takeaways and will spur you to action to do something so that we can rebuild our economy. And we have Secretary Pernia to lead us. Thank you very much. And I would say and thank you. we meet again. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.